All right, Chair Sisko, this is Recording Secretary Mike Maloney. We are ready when you are. Okay, welcome to tonight's meeting of the City of Santa Rosa Planning Commission. I'm going to begin tonight by reading this statement, which is due to the provisions of the governor's executive orders N-25-20 and N-29-20, which suspend certain requirements of the Brown Act and the order of the health officer of the County of Sonoma to shelter in place to minimize the spread of COVID-19. The planning commissioners will be conducting today's meeting in a virtual setting using Zoom webinar. Commissioners and staff are participating from remote locations and or practicing appropriate social distancing. Members of the public may view and listen to the meeting as noted on the city's website and as noted on the agenda. Members of the public wishing to speak during uh, any item, public comment, or during our public hearing items, will be able to do so by raising their hand and will be given the ability to address the commission. So with that, I also wanna remind the public to be patient. There's little three to five second delays, particularly when we uh, shift to different speakers. So just sort of uh, appreciate the, the virtual setting that we're in. So with that, um, I will ask for a roll call, please. Let the record reflect that all commissioners are present. And with that, uh, we have no minutes tonight. And I'm gonna go ahead and move to public comments, which is a time for any member of the public to address the commission on matters of interest to the commission, which are not listed tonight as a public hearing. If you uh, wish to make a comment uh, via Zoom, you please select the little raised hand uh, feature if you're dialing in uh, by telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Um, that will cue the, the host that you're there. Um, the host will give you permission. He will unmute you. Please state your name for the record and you have three minutes to speak. There will be a little timer on the screen that will tell you how much, uh, how you're doing in terms of time. So with that, um, any public comments, coming through. Yes, it appears we have a Mark Henry Parrish who's raising his hand. We'll go ahead and give him permission to speak. It'll just be one second. We're having a technical issue. One second. So we're going to skip the public comment slide and just uh, let people talk. We have a Mark Parrish. Yes, hello. Can you folks hear me okay? Okay, yes. So, um, yeah, just basically a uh, quick thing I want to talk about is um, how these online meetings, you know, are, are, are not allowing a lot of our... Um, uh, disadvantaged folks uh, to participate in these meetings. There's a lot of folks that do not have a computer or they do not have 24 seven internet connectivity. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. <laughs> so I'll continue. So uh, again, it's, um, Regarding, you know, the the uh, the lack of uh, full participation by the public, uh, you know, being able to uh, when we had the meetings at City Hall, you know, people could just show up and and uh, you know express their concerns or comments, you know, um, without having to have an internet connection or a cell phone or 
whatever it takes to participate these days. So uh, I just think it's not fair, you know, to the public and this, uh, these particular meetings perhaps should be on hold until such time that we can go back to the normal um, presentation, you know, in person at City Hall. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other hands raised. Okay. So with that, I'll go ahead and close the public comment um, period and move on to Planning Commissioner's report. Any reports tonight? Just give me a wave. Not seeing any. And on to department reports. Okay, great. Um, this is Claire Hartman. I'm the deputy director for planning. Uh, a couple of things to go over just as heads up for everyone out there watching the planning commission. Uh, our city's website is a one stop shop, if you will, for anything related to the COVID-19 event. Uh, you will want to go to our city website, srcity.org slash emergency. That's where we put everything as a clearinghouse across our city organization, also has resources for residents uh, and uh, commercial businesses and the like. So that is uh, srcity.org slash emergency. Um, also wanna give an update on our virtual permit counter. I think at our last meeting, I announced we had uh, recently opened a virtual permit counter for planning and economic development. Uh, <clears throat> Something we had always wanted to do, but uh, obviously uh, in this situation, we were challenged to do it in short order. Um, and so I'm pleased to say that we were able to pull it off and we've been quite successful to date. We started on May 1st and the last statistics I got were that we received 600 building permit applications through this virtual center. We received 45 planning applications and 200 engineering permit applications. So we know that the word is getting out. We're accepting any and all applications moving forward with much needed housing and commercial enterprises in the city. And so this was our ability to get it, uh, to, to get going and, and to continue to take in applications. Uh, we are um, <clears throat> looking to open the permit counter to uh, appointment only, uh, physical uh, present type of submittals, but uh, I don't have a date certain yet on when we will be able to open. Uh, we're just now evaluating how to get staff back in the office safely and honor social distancing. And then shortly after that, we'll be in initiating protocols so that our customers will be safe. Um, if they do need uh, to come in physically and cannot make use of our virtual counter, but in the meantime, we're sending applicants to uh, SR city slash emergency slash permit. That's SR city slash emergency slash permit. You will get to our permit center in that, in that way across our planning and economic development permit. So any permits, building permits, engineering permits or planning permits, that should be your first stop uh, to get applications and advice on how to submit. Another exciting program that's come out of uh, this effort of responding to the crisis uh, is an open and out program. So we just launched this. Um, in fact, we just sent it out in our community newsletter. And what open and out is, is a uh, co sort of a collective or comprehensive approach at supporting our restaurants in the city, uh, all throughout the city, and supporting the need for outdoor dining uh, even though as the order progresses, uh, it allows for some interior use of restaurants that's still quite limiting because you need to support the social distancing requirements. And so, uh, many of our restaurants are really small and tight. And so it is a challenge um, to make use of. And so what we've done is we've come up with three uh, program areas. One is a temporary sidewalk seating program 
where you can do a sidewalk cafe. Maybe you didn't have one before the crisis, but now you need one. So there's a way to get that. Uh, we're also doing a pilot program for parklets. So these are gonna be allowed on public streets, but also private parking lots. And then also we're looking at a temporary closure of 4th Street between B Street and E Street and some programming of that space. Uh, and that is, so that's specific to our downtown and that is estimated to open on June 26. Otherwise you are welcome to apply for uh, temporary sidewalk seating or parklets. And where you go on the website is srcity.org slash open and out. And then lastly, a heads up um, also just came out recently was our, in response to the most recent event, which is the protests and the issue regarding um, police practices and policies. And that is our Santa Rosa Community Empowerment Plan. Now that uh, empowerment plan was um, developed in response to this issue and is a strategic plan that addresses Santa Rosa Police Department policies and practices, and will address them through a strategic process with community input. And so this plan will be presented to the city council on June 30th. And the website to access the plan and any updates to it, including um, all the various ways to comment and participate in the process is srcity.org slash community empowerment. So um, it, in addition to sending comments uh, into the city through that uh, website, we, you can also participate in the council meeting. It's a study session on June 30th. And that concludes my report. Great, thank you. Um, next, any statements of extension by commissioners? Good, good. Uh, there is no study session tonight nor any consent items. So with that, we're gonna to move to our first public hearing tonight, which is item 10.1, a public hearing on our capital improvement program general plan consistency. It is not an ex parte disclosure. And uh, with that, um, I will turn it over to staff who is Sherry Meads. Thank you and good afternoon, Chair Cisco, Vice Chair Weeks and members of the commission. I'm Sherry Mead, city planner. The item before you is a review of the fiscal year 2021 draft capital improvement. Okay. Sorry to cut you off there. We don't have the PowerPoint up yet. Can you uh, hold on one second? Oh, gosh, I was so excited. <laughs> one second. All right, Chair, you are good to go. I will start from the top. Thank you and good afternoon, Chair Cisco, Vice Chair Weeks and members of the commission. Again, I'm Sherry Mead, City Planner. The item before you is a review of the fiscal year 2020-2021 draft capital improvement program for consistency with the general plan. Next slide, please. Sorry, I'm having a little trouble with this computer. We have windows layered on top of windows. It's still sloppy. Yeah. 
There we go. The capital improvement program is the city's five-year plan that establishes funding for public improvements. California law requires that planning agencies review public works projects for conformity with the general plan. And so the action before you this afternoon is to make the finding that each of the 16 projects are consistent with our adopted general plan. Next slide, please. Projects included in the draft 2020-2021 capital improvement program include upgrades to local water and local and sub-regional sewer infrastructure, the development of strategic asset management plans and catastrophic reserve studies for local operations and regional operations systems, improvements to street and bike lane infrastructure, and improvement of an existing park facility. The following six slides represent a selection of projects included in the draft 2020-2021 capital improvement program, which implement a number of general plan goals and policies. Next slide, please. The general plan recognizes the need to serve existing as well as projected demand for water. The capital improvement program includes maintenance and improvement projects that address the city's water infrastructure needs. This project will replace water mains under Rock Creek Drive, Matanzas Way, and Hammond Drive between Hohen Avenue and Patio Court. This project is consistent with the general plan policy to maintain existing levels of water service by preserving and improving infrastructure, replacing water mains as necessary, and improving water main transmission lines. Nine of this year's projects advance the goal of preserving and improving water infrastructure in various locations. Next slide, please. This slide shows the installation of both sewer and water mains within the Grace neighborhood. The project implements general plan policies to maintain existing levels of water and wastewater service. The ability to provide existing and future land uses with adequate wastewater service is a fundamental goal of the general plan. The CIP includes projects that replace aging infrastructure and increase wastewater system efficiency at the local and sub-regional level. Next slide, please. The general plan addresses the long-term need to develop a citywide system of designated bikeways to maximize bicycle use for commuting, recreation, and local transport. The capital improvement program includes a project to increase comfort for bicyclists and pedestrians using the Stony Point Active Transportation Corridor, corridor on Stony Point Road between Sebastopol Road and West Street. The exact scope of work will be based on the results of a planning study that is currently in progress. This project helps to implement the general plan policy to pursue implementation of walking and biking facilities as envisioned in the city's bicycle and pedestrian master plan. Next slide, please. The general plan underscores the value of orderly and balanced roadway throughout the city to provide safe and efficient access to communities. This project will install a traffic signal to prevent excessive delays on Burbank Avenue with the addition of new residential development in the area. Next slide, please. The general plan addresses the need to both maintain and improve public recreation areas. And the capital improvement program for 2020-2021 includes funding for Pear Blossom Neighborhood Park. The project involves planning studies with community interest in adding a dog park and other improvements. Next slide, please. The provision of adequate police and fire services to the community is emphasized in the general plan. This last example shows a project to consolidate water service in nine Santa Rosa communities. The project will improve fire protection services and is consistent with general plan policy related to improving water service infrastructure as well. Next slide, please. The finding of consistency with the general plan is exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act. The findings of consistency does not have a direct or indirect physical change on the environment. And further, any of these projects will have specific envir environmental review by either the environmental coordinator, which is a city staff member, or any applicable review authority. Next slide, please. So with that, the Planning and Economic Development Department recommends that the Planning Commission find the projects included in the fiscal year 
2020-2021 draft capital improvement program to be consistent with the general plan. Next slide. And I'm happy to answer any questions. We also have quite a deep bench tonight. Joining us are Jason Nutt, Assistant City Manager of Public Works, Andy Allen, Supervising Engineer for Water and Asset Management, Jen Santos, Deputy Director of Parks, Emma Walton, Deputy Director, Engineering Resources, Rob Sprinkle, Deputy Director, Public Works and Traffic, Gabe Osborne, Deputy Director, Development Services for Planning and Economic Development, and Lori, and I am not positive whether it's Urbanic or Urbanec, it's cool either way, Deputy Director, Capital Projects Engineering, and Nancy Adams, Transportation Planner. And I've asked that they raise their hands when a question, if a question is asked that is more within their purview. Thank you. Great, thank you, um, Ms. Meads. So I'm gonna wait for the screen to go back to the commissioners here. Great. Um, commissioners, any, any questions of staff? Any of these staff, there's a lot of them. Yes, Vice Chair Weeks. Um, I, this is probably a question for Nancy. Um, I was wondering, um, the planning study, the bike and ped planning study that was mentioned, I was wondering when that would be done. You guys please repeat your request. Mr. Weeks, can you repeat your question? Yes, um, when is the planning study for the, uh, the bike and pedestrian planning study that was mentioned? I was wondering when that was gonna be done. It's not important if um, nobody knows, it's, it's fine. Uh, commissioners, I think the planner lost a uh, connection. We're trying to get her back in. That, that's okay, don't worry about it. Hey, Sherry, it looks like you were unmuted if you're able to respond to the commissioner question. I actually don't have an answer to that. I was going to reach out and see if any of the other Members on the bench would have an answer for that. Hi, May. This is Rob Sprinkle with the, the Public Works Department. Um, so we were planned to finish the study um, by July 1st, but with the COVID um, virus, it, it's been pushed off. Um, we're planning to meet with the um, bike board in, in our July meeting and then we'll be moving the project forward from there. So we are a couple months behind, but the, the planning part of the project should be finished, um, probably, I would say by September. Okay, any other questions? This, this is Nancy, can you hear me now? <laughs> Hello? Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> oh, good. I couldn't get, I think I finally got to be unmuted. So thank you. So Rob is right, um, we did, uh, w trains is working on the um the feasibility study and we we've had um, some preliminary information from them but we haven't had a chance yet to have a convene a, a bike board meeting for since march so we're hoping to, to to get those meetings maybe virtually in the next month or two and then um we it, it's pushing the schedule off probably till the more towards the end of the year um and then once we get the results from that um we'll be able to you know, identify some potential capital um, improvements out there for bikes and ped enhancement along that corridor. So that's that's the goal. Great, thank you for that. Anything else on that, Vice Chair Weeks, before I move on to Charles Carter? Okay, great, Commissioner Carter. 
Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, it, this is either for Mr. Sprinkle or Ms. Adams. Um, the, the other project on tonight's agenda uh, references the intersection improvement at Burbank and Hearn, but the traffic study for that project also uh, mentions a number of other improvements to the Burbank Avenue corridor, including continuous sidewalks and bike lanes and the possible addition of a city bus route. Uh, is there any um, indication or any thought to when those projects might uh, make it onto a, a capital improvement plan? This is Rob. I'll go ahead and answer that question. Um, the the um, the signal is definitely uh, in the forefront with a more immediate need than the um, well, not there's not a need for the other improvements, but. Um, the other improvements regarding the widening for the bike lanes and the sidewalks typically are done as development occurs along those um, parcels. And that's how those are typically um, funded as well as through, um, the, through the development of those parcels is when the improvements are done. Um, if we were to go in with a CIP project, we would actually be purchasing all the, prod, all the parcels and um, the project that we have on our CIP for this for the signal does not include any of that type of detail. Um, in, in conjunction with the or in, in the bus route, I'm not sure when that bus route is being planned, so I'd have to check in with um, transit on that portion. Anything else on that, Commissioner Carter? Okay. Anyone else having a question? Okay, not seeing any, then um, we'll go ahead and move on to uh, the public hearing tonight. It is a public hearing. And again, um, if you're uh, coming in through Zoom, you would push your little raised hand feature. If you're dialing in, you dial star nine. And so the host can pick you up and put you in the queue. Again, you'll be unmuted uh, when it's your turn to speak. You have three minutes, uh, the three minutes the expiration of the three minutes, you'll automatically be muted again. So um, anyone wanting to speak on this? At this time, we are not seeing anybody raise their hands. Okay. Well, I'll wait a second for us to go back to the commissioner's screen. And with that, any other questions of staff on this item? And I'm closing the public hearing. <laughs> I don't have my gavel. Okay, um, no other questions. Okay, so would somebody like to move the resolution tonight? Okay. Commissioner Duggan. I'll move a resolution of the Planning Commission of the City of Santa Rosa finding that the projects included in the draft 2020-2021 Capital Improvement Program are consistent with the Santa Rosa General Plan file number ST20-001 and waive further reading. Second. And that was Commissioner Collier who seconded. That was moved by Commissioner Duggan, seconded by Commissioner Kalia, and uh, the recording secretary will call for our votes. Yes, if you can just give me one second. Sure. You all are doing great with the muting, unmuting. I'm having a struggle with my screen, so <laughs> if I'm causing static, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, system's ready for us to take a vote now. I'm gonna go ahead and go in alphabetical order. So starting with Commissioner Carter. Uh, I can make the finding that the program is consistent with the general plan and we'll be voting aye. And Commissioner Duggan. 
I vote aye. Commissioner Kelly? Aye. Commissioner Okrepke? Aye. Commissioner Peterson? I can make the necessary findings and vote aye. Vice Chair Weeks? I vote aye. And Chair Cisco. And I also vote aye. So with that, that is going to pass with seven ayes. And I believe that concludes this item. And um, staff, do you wanna take a just a short break before we move to the next item or do you feel ready to, to move to the next item right now? Uh, they've indicated that they do not want to break. We can go ahead and continue if you're ready for it. Okay. All right. So with that, we're going to go ahead and move on to item uh, 10.2, which is the uh, Burbank Avenue subdivision conditional use permit appeal. Um, it is an ex parte disclosure. Um, Commissioner Peterson, anything to disclose? Uh, I had a telephone call with a representative for Burbank Housing uh, discussing uh, their part of the project, but uh, no new information that hasn't been publicly disclosed. Okay. Mr. Okrepke. No new information, I have nothing to disclose. Vice Chair Weeks. There, um, I also had a conversation with a um, representative from Burbank Housing. Um, I visited the site before uh, we heard the item a few months ago, and I also watched the design review board uh, meeting last Thursday and nothing new to disclose. Okay, Commissioner Carter. I also had a conversation with a representative of Burbank Housing and had visited the site a couple of times and have nothing further to disclose. Commissioner Duggan? I have nothing new to disclose. And Commissioner Kalyad? I also had a conversation with a representative of Burbank Housing and uh, visited the site again and I have nothing further to disclose. Um, I watched the uh, design review board uh, appeal of the zoning administrator's uh, decision last week. I also rewatched our February 13th meeting uh, considering this item uh, when we were considering the tentative map and uh, no new information. So with that, we this is an appeal tonight. So we do it a little bit differently than um, we typically do uh our regular agenda items so um we're going to begin with our uh staff presentation about 15 minutes then our zoning administrator um andy Gustafson, is going to have a chance to um speak to us we'll have the applicant presentation about 15 minutes the appellant will have an opportunity uh to present about 15 minutes and then the applicant does have an opportunity to respond to the appellant's uh, presentation for about five minutes. So um, that's the uh, order that we're going to be going in. And with that, let's begin with, with staff, who uh, will be Adam Rose. Um, Adam Ross, sorry. Bill Rose and Adam Ross. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Cisco, members of the commission. Uh, my, are you hearing me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Adam Ross, a project city planner, project planner for the Burbank Avenue subdivision. The item before you is the appeal of the minor conditional use permit. Next slide, please. The site is located in the um, southwest quadrant of the city. Next slide, please. At 1400 Burbank Avenue. Here's an overview of the site. Uh, one thing I wanted to... Uh, put out there at the beginning of this was there was a um, uh, 
the public notice was, uh, there was one portion that was incorrect. It said 136 lots. It should say 75 lots. Um, however, the rest as far as unit counts go is correct. Um, the zoning code allows us to, um, to move forward with items and, and act on them, um, uh, and act on them um, for something like that. Uh, it's because it still represents most of the project. Uh, next slide, please. The total unit count is 138 units. Um, they're all market rate at this time, um, which is 5.4% of the regional, regional housing needs assessment and housing action plan goal, which is 5,000 units by 2022. Next slide, please. Bit of the, about the project. Um, this is a, the item before you is a minor conditional use permit uh, to allow a residential small lot subdivision. 75 lots are proposed, each lot containing one of three housing types. Uh, 62 are detached single family, 12 uh, are duets, which are single family attached, meaning each one of those attached uh, units has, um, are on their own lots. And then 64 units are within a multifamily uh, apartment complex. Uh, again, 100% of this project is market rate. Next slide, please. Uh, it's 10.39 acres of net developable, developable area out of the 14.25 acres. Uh, 3.86 of those acres is for new public right of way. Uh, the lot sizes range um, being the smallest is 2,729 square feet. The largest is 8,517 square feet. And the average lot size is 4,687 square feet. Uh, the multifamily units um, are located on one lot, which is 90, approximately 90,198 square feet. Uh, that lot is on the southwest corner of the site abutting Burbank Avenue. Uh, some of the associated infrastructure are new city streets, uh, frontages, sidewalks, um, and bike, uh, bike lanes. Um, and the project is accessed off Burbank Avenue. Uh, part of the scope of the uh, minor conditional use permit for a residential small lot subdivision is uh, is uh, uh, signifying the, the lot sizes. Uh, anything under 6,000 square feet it requires a residential small lot subdivision. And as you can see here, you have them from 2,700 to 4,600 as well. Next slide, please. Uh, this project uh, uh, also um, is uh, subject to the resilient city development measures, uh, which is found in section 20-16 of the zoning code. Um, it allows small lot subdivisions to be approved by minor use permits rather than uh, major use permits. Um, it takes the major design review permit down to a minor design review permit um, after a concept uh, meeting is held. And um, then one part of the zoning code 20-42.140D requires that the use permit for a small lot subdivision be approved prior to the uh, to the map approval. Next slide, please. The existing land uses around the site. Um, the site is mostly vacant, currently vacant. There are some outhouses and um, older older uh, older residences that were um, that were since removed for uh, being in, in poor shape. Um, you have subdivisions to the uh, east. To the north, you have a um, some some existing homes and buildings. Uh, south is are more existing homes. Uh, west of the site is the Roseland School District and an elementary school. And then you have the she uh, Shepherd Elevated, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Accelerated Elementary School to the east. Next slide, please. Some of the project history. Um, Pre-app meeting was held in 2018 on the project was then submitted on August 13th. Um, November 7th, the design review board had a concept item. Uh, a, a meeting was held and this item was reviewed by the design review board as a concept item as part of the resilient city development measures. Uh, they gave comments and recommendations to the design um, and those were carried, fo carried forward in the uh, re revisal of, that, of the application. Um, the zoning administrator held a special meeting, um, which was a, 
uh, which was a public hearing as requested by the public on February 5th, 2020. At that time, the ZA made findings and approved the minor conditional use permit and minor design review permit. Um, on February 13th, the item came before the Planning Commission where the commission made findings for approval of the tentative map. On February 20, on February 18th, an appeal was filed for the minor use permit and minor design review permit, and the map was appealed on February 24th. Next slide, please. The general plan land use designation is uh, medium low density residential, which allows uh, eight to 13 units per acre. This project uh, in total is nine units per acre. Um, which is above the minimum requirement, but not quite to the uh, mid-range. Next slide, please. During the analysis of the of the project, the general, the some of the goals highlighted here um, implement the general plan land use policies. Uh, so it. Um, ensure project subdivisions and neighborhoods are designed to foster livability, um, maintain a diversity of neighborhoods and varied housing stock, uh, which satisfy a wide range of needs. Um, don't let a development be less than the minimum density prescribed by the land use classification um, and provide, uh, maintain a balance of various housing types in each neighborhood. Um, and, include, and ensure the new development does not result in undue concentration of once of a single housing type in one neighborhood and more uh, develop attractive, safe and extensive network for pedestrians and cyclists. Next slide, please. Part of this uh, analysis uh, also includes the Roseland Area Sebastopol Road specific plan, which is also a priority development area. Um, the Roseland Sebastopol Area Sub Roseland Area Sebastopol Road specific plan is a planning level document that addresses land use, circulation, and infrastructure needs for the area. Uh, the specific, specific plan was developed concurrently with consideration of annexation of the previously unincorporated area. And the plan area includes the Roseland priority development area and the Sebastopol Road priority development area. And um, this relates to resilient city development measures where uh, those reduced review authorities or those modified review authorities, I should say, um, uh, apply to priority development areas. Next slide, please. Some of the goals and policies of the Roseland Area Specific Plan are highlighted here, um, include, which includes a mix of housing types, such as single family residences with duplexes and triplexes, townhomes and apartment units for all income levels, encourage development of quality well-built well-built attractive market rate and below market rate that contribute to the character of, of the neighborhood um, and require dedication of right-of-way um, and, and street related to street improvements or new streets as identified in the circulation plan. Next slide, please. The zoning for this site is R16SR, which is single family residential um, scenic Road for Burbank Avenue Zoning District. Uh, a small lot subdivision use permit is allowed in an R16 zoning district. Um, and the Burbank Avenue Zoning uh, Scenic Road combining district requires a 25 foot setback measured from edge of pavement, edge of pavement um, to a two story or greater structure or one story structure element uh, with over 25. Uh, with a height of over 25 feet. This project proposes a setback greater than 25 feet from the edge of pavement. Next slide, please. Part of the review of the minor use permit for the residential sm small lot subdivision um, solidifies the, the, um, the lot size. Uh, as stated previously, they're 2,700 to 8,500 square feet in lot size. Building height, um, the building height for zoning in this in R16 is 35 feet. This project is at 34 and uh, three quarter feet, I believe. Um, and uh, or 34, right under 35 feet total. Um, setbacks, it complies with all setbacks. Uh, the small lot subdivision allows uh, smaller setbacks um, as opposed to a normal um, normal R16 zoning. Those uh, smaller setbacks would be four feet for a side yard setback eight feet for a second story side yard setback. 
Um, typically, you'd see five feet side yard, 10 feet second story side yard. Uh, and um, uh, alterations to those can be reviewed and approved by the, by the uh, approval body. In this case, um, the only alternative setback for within the small lot subdivision is to allow a second story set, uh, side setback of seven feet um, on one side of each lot of each lot that would only apply to um, some of the single family uh, detached homes um, and that would be established uh, in the uh, mass in the um, the building permit phase uh, and outdoor lighting the project would comply with 20-30.80 of the uh, lighting requirements next slide please Here's the site plan. Um, again, you have uh, duplexes on the northwest portion of the site, single family mixed throughout, new public roads, and uh, four buildings for the uh, 64 multifamily units on the southwest corner of the site. Next slide, please. Here's the tentative map that is associated with the site plan, which uh, comes from the, which is attached to the residential small lot subdivision. Next slide, please. The landscape plan um, for the site, which includes uh, valley oaks and um, coast live oaks uh, and um, perimeter landscaping as well. Next slide, please. This is a typical block second section of the um, single family detached homes. As you can see, you have street trees, um, uh, new sidewalk, curb and gutter, and uh, um, and the uh, side yard setback would be for the interior lots for that seven foot second story side yard setback. Next slide, please. Here are the single family attached ele uh, kind of site plan, close up of the site plan. That is, um, these are the duets, each on their own lots. Next slide, please. Here's a overview of the block section. Next slide, please. Here are the multifamily units, um, a blow up of the uh, site plan area for these. Next slide, please. So these are the multifamily elevations for reference. Um, these are just some of the changes that came from previous uh, design review board um, comments and recommendations and the, and the recently uh, approved last week um, design application. Next slide, please. So again, there's the building height of 34.7 feet at top of roof, uh, roof pitch. Next slide, please. More multifamily elevations for reference. Again, this was uh, approved by the design review board last uh, Thursday. Next slide, please. And here's a uh, bird's eye view of the uh, multifamily units. Next slide, please. Some of the public improvements uh, previously stated are found in the uh, Roseland Area Sebastopol Road specific plan. Um, that includes 50 feet of uh, 60, uh, I'm sorry, a 62 foot public right of way, a 10 foot travel lane, six foot class two bicycle lane, an eight and a half foot bioswell, um, and a six foot sidewalk. This would be on Burbank Avenue as it fronts the property. Next slide, please. The parking, um, parking for this site, uh, the total uh, required are 421 and the provided spaces are 450. So it complies with city parking standards. Next slide, please. Some of the um, uh, conditions uh, that were added from last week's uh, design review board uh, approval of the project are, are amendments for consideration. Um, I'm sorry, conditions of approval for consideration. Uh, that includes adding a two foot fence extension on the south uh, 
south portion of the property, uh, the, which would be the fence between the multifamily units and the existing single family to the south. Consider add, uh, adding additional valley live oaks. Uh, consider adding two, a two-story approach. So bringing the buildings down to two stories rather than three and consider heritage protection throughout the site and consider increasing the diversification of trees throughout the site. Next slide, please. Um, public, some of the public correspondence, um, the concerns were access to the site, the density and size of three-story buildings, barriers separating the parking and the existing single family homes um, surrounding the site, uh, particularly south where the parking lot of the multifamily units are, new public roads um, and, and what that looks like connecting to Crucero Lane in the future, potential light pollution and CEQA review. Next slide, please. Placement of the multifamily units within the subdivision, uh, what the phasing looks like, and compatibility with the Roseland Area Sebastopol Road specific plan. Next slide, please. Uh, staff response includes um, about the project is access is taken off Burbank Avenue with new public and private roads. The They're all public roads except within the multifamily units. Um, traffic engineering reviewed the project and provided conditions of approval. One of that, as previously discussed, is a traffic signal on Burbank Avenue and Hearn Avenue at the intersection. Um, it requires the applicant to pay a fair share, uh, which is roughly one third of the total cost of that. The city is moving forward with the design and installation um, of, of that traffic signal at that intersection. Um, and a good neighbor fence is proposed between the multifamily units and the existing residential units to the south. Next slide, please. And again, all lighting will comply with the city's outdoor lighting ordinance um, found in zoning code section 20-30.080. And a noise impact analysis was uh, included with this project. Um, and what it found was that everything in this project was standard with normal uh, residential noise um, and that no additional sound walls or anything were required with this project. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the project provided a biological assessment. It indicated um, that no California tiger salamander was found and it's unlikely to occur in the future, but uh, the project applicants would still have to work with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife over California tiger salamander mitigations. Um, this site and most of the southwest quadrant of the city is within the tiger salamander critical habitat. Um, and that would, and it depends on if they find them on site, uh, what the, what the uh, mitigations would be required. Typically this would be, uh, since none are, were found on site and it, and it's within the, um, it's within the, uh, critical habitat, there's still some, um, uh, some sort of, uh, coordination with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife required. Um, and the project complies with CEQA statutory exemption uh, 65457, which is found in the California Government Code, um, which is also 15182 AC, which is which are projects pursuant to a specific plan. In this case, it was pursuant to the Roseland Area Sebastopol Road specific plan. Um, and also 15183, um, projects pursuant to a general plan for streamlining. Next slide, please. The basis of the appeal um, includes, uh, filed by Mark Henry Parrish, uh, is a lack of information available to the public at the time of the zoning administrator uh, public hearing. Um, but, uh, I'm sorry, hold on one second. Um, so, <laughs> So part of that was um, from the from the appellant. Uh, it's based on the lack of information given to the public about the project known as the Burbank Avenue subdivision. Both the planning hearing and zoning administrator, uh, they, uh, the appellant claimed that there was inadequate information available at the public meeting. Um, but the, the part of that is because of the resilient city development measures. So it goes, so it's that reduced review authority. 
So it goes from um, a major to a minor, which is uh, reviewed and approved by the, or reviewed, approved, denied, or continued by the zoning administrator. Um, and uh, during that, during the meeting, um, uh, <clears throat> so, dur and during the meeting, the, zo the zoning administrator has the authority to act on the uh, minor conditional use permit and minor design review. Um, and then the map goes, went to the planning commission as well. Uh, the ZA public hearing for the project was noticed in, accordan in accordance with section 20-66.020 of the zoning code. Um, notices of the ZA meeting were mailed on January 24th uh, before the special ZA meeting on February 5th, 2020. Uh, the public had access to the files, plans, and attachments at City Hall as stated in the notice. Um, at times, uh, the public did come and view the files uh, with staff. Uh, the process for that is uh, they come in, I just make sure that the um, cultural resource survey was redacted from the file as required by law, and then uh, let them review the project files and answered any follow-up questions if they had them. Um, and uh, the second uh, basis of appeal is protection of heritage trees. Um, that there are existing heritage trees on the site, uh, specifically for the Roseland, uh, the Burbank Avenue Scenic Road um, combining district. But uh, this project, um, part of that, uh, I'm sorry, part of that includes um, requirements in the zoning code of what that looks like, uh, which includes the project, the Development proposals and subdivision applications shall clearly designate all trees on the property by trunk location and drip line. Um, that was provided on the tentative map, sheet number two of six of the tentative map, um, as well as in the uh, project project narrative as to why uh, trees would be removed. Um, there is also a uh, DAC on the DAC report condition number 10. Uh, requires a Valley Oak tree mitigation plan to be reviewed and approved prior to any sort of grading permit. So that's any ground disturbing activity. Um, and in this case, the trees being removed are necessary to build the required public right of way improvements. These improvements include new, new sidewalks, street trees, bike lane, curb and gutter. Um, and uh, uh, those conditions of approval that I said about condition 10 in the um, DAC report that comes directly from the mitigation monitoring and reporting program, which comes from the EIR from the Roseland Area Spassel Road, Road specific plan. Uh, and the and then in response to the preservation of the private driveway, um, the project does not include private driveway roadway improvements or additional access to the private roadway south of the project site. Um, there are there's a stub for a future connection, but that's retained on the on the project site uh, and would not continue into any neighboring properties until such a time as those uh, may be developed. That may or may not happen, um, but in this case, it's, it's provided uh, for connection in the future. Next slide, please. The proposed project has, be, has been reviewed in compliance with CEQA. Uh, as previously stated, it's section 65457 of the California Government Code, which is also CEQA guidelines section 15182AC. Um, and in this case, the project implements and is consistent with the Roseland Area Spassel Road specific plan for which an EIR was certified by City Council, resolution number 28873, dated October 6, 18, 2016. Next slide, please. Um, and is additionally the project's pursuant to CEQA guidelines section 15183. The project is consistent with general plan and zoning for which an EIR was certified by council in 2009. Um, there was a Burbank Avenue subdivision consistency determination memo uh, prepared by First Carbon Solutions dated December 18, 2019, uh, which is a qualified uh, CEQA consultant. Um, the 15182 and 15183 analysis indicated that there are no project specific effects which are peculiar to the project or site and was that was supported by um, surveys and analyses which include special plant, biological, cultural resource and traffic. Next slide please. 
And with that, the zoning administrator and the planning and economic development department recommend that the commission by resolution deny the appeal and approve the residential small lot subdivision minor conditional use permit for the Burbank Avenue subdivision. Next slide, please. And that's it for staff's presentation. Again, Adam, uh, my name is Adam Ross and I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Great, thanks, Mr. Ross. Um, <clears throat> be before you leave us, um, could you go over uh, what our, and maybe it's Ms. Crocker that might need to chime in here, exactly what our options are tonight. This is an appeal, so it's a little bit different. Our purview is, um, it's different than when we looked, we heard the tentative map. So could you go through those options for us, please? And what the impact of those options, taking one or the other, how that impacts the appeal of the tentative map, which will be in front of council next week. Yes, I can do that for you. One second, I'm sorry. Okay, so um, this is a de novo public hearing. So that means of new, and therefore the commission can review and discuss anything related to the minor conditional use permit. Um, PC's decision, the uh, planning commission's decision on the small lot appeal um, and how it relates to the tentative map are, um, are, are a few. Uh, the commission can take several actions regarding this, this uh, minor use permit appeal. Uh, if the commission denies the appeal and approves the project, the tentative map appeal will go on to the council uh, on June 16, 2020. If the commission were to uphold the appeal and deny the project, the previously approved tentative map would become invalid and it would no longer move forward to the council on appeal. If the commission chooses to uh, condition the project that would result in changes to the site plan, then the previous tentative map approval would need to be amended and reviewed by staff uh, to see if any major changes uh, would require new conditions of approval or a, a re-review would be required. And then it would be brought back to the commission for approval. If the commission continues the project to a date uncertain, then the tentative map could be continued by council. Um, if the appeal is upheld and the minor use permit is denied, the tentative map would become invalid and would again would not be seen by the council on June 16th. Uh, the, the applicant would then have to resubmit a new application for entitlements. If the project is continued um, and required to be brought back to the, to the planning commission, should uh, there be any significant changes uh, resulted from this appeal hearing, um, it would have to be reviewed by staff and brought back to the commission as well. Okay, thanks for that clarification. And uh, commissioners, I would like us to hold our um, in-depth questions until uh, after the, the public hearing, but are there any other clarifying type of questions on, on this one? Yeah, Vice Chair Weeks. Um, Adam, you said that uh, if there were any major changes the tentative map would have to be redone. What is there a definition of major? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so if, say if there's a condition that changes uh, any of the lots, uh, then there need to be a, a, a new map or an amended map. So that it may, major changes may not have been the correct language to use, but uh, Anything that would change, say, reduce lots um, that are re reduced lot sizes, increase lot sizes. Um, but I will uh, actually ask that um, uh, engineering and development services provide a more technical answer. Uh, thank you. Just a quick microphone check. Can everybody hear me? Perfect. Thank you. This is Gabe Osborne. Um, good afternoon, uh, Chair Cisco and members of the Commission, uh, Deputy Director of Development Services. Uh, typically, the way it works when a tentative map is approved and the final map is final, the, the city engineer has to make the determination that the final map is in substantial conformance with the conditions of the tentative map. Um, so that puts it in a very small box of the items that it can actually change. 
Um, because through the tentative map, we are dealing with preliminary and conceptual drawings and they're not construction drawings, there has to be some level of tolerance that utilities can move around. Lot lines may shift a little bit to fit building products, but we don't change the lot count. We don't change the boundary of the subdivision and we don't change any circulation elements or elements that would potentially affect the surrounding property owners. Uh, mainly because that decision does not involve a public process. It is just the city engineer makes that finding. So the decisions have to be very technical in nature to make sure all the pieces fit. Um, so public roadway width, circulation, shouldn't change from tentative map to final. Landscaping, things of that nature, some of the visual elements can change, but lot counts uh, definitely do not. And the subdivision boundary definitely does not. And the overall alignment of utilities typically doesn't. They may move around a little bit in the street, um, but overall, what we see design-wise in the tentative map should really hold in the final map. Any other clarifying questions? Okay, and then uh, Mr. Ross, if you would, um, I realize Mr. Osborne is here, but you could t could you please uh, name the other staff uh, departments that are available when we do have questions? Yeah, that would be Gabe Osborne, uh, Gerald Dugas, uh, Rob Sprinkle, uh, Gabe and Carol are in uh, engineering and development services. Uh, Rob Sprinkle is transportation uh, planning, um, uh, transportation engineering. Uh, and uh, we also have Ian Hartage with the fire department. Um, myself, Bill Rose, Claire Hartman, and, uh, and Ashley Crocker. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Um, okay, so... With that, we're going to go ahead and move on to um, our zoning administrator, Mr. Gustafson, uh, to give us his presentation of what happened at the ZA meeting. Thank you. This is Andy Gustafson, and I was acting zoning administrator on February 5th, 2020. Um, I'm hopeful that you can hear me clearly. Um, so what I'm going to do is describe uh, and outline the information, outline that meeting and, and describe the information and comments that were presented that led to the approval of the requested minor design review and minor conditional use permit for the proposed Burbank project, which included um, not only the small lot residential subdivision, but also the um, uh, multifamily units. As noted by Adam Ross, the Resilient Development City Measures chapter of the Zoning Code directs these entitlements to the Zoning Administrator to address the immediate need for housing and economic development following the Tubbs and Nuns fire in 2017. While these measures reduce the hearing authority, the findings and requirements to approve a project remain unchanged. So um, with that, the matter came before the Zoning Administrator I called the meeting to order. And as with um, this planning commission meeting, you follow the same process. The project planner presented the project and, um, and the recommended res resolution, uh, which uh, asked or, or supported the approval of the project with conditions, and then also described how the project qualified for two California Environmental Quality Act exemptions because the project was consistent with the Roseland specific plan and the city's general plan. Um, the project planner provided information on a wide variety of topics that supported the necessary findings for both the use permit and the design review, including that the project was consistent with the general plan. It complied with zoning development standards was consistent with the city's subdivision lot configuration and improvement requirements. It fulfilled the multifamily design guidelines. Um, and um, the project planner identified the changes the applicant had made to the project design in response to an earlier concept design review by the design review board. Um, after the project planner's presentation, the applicant and the applicant's design team then was um, given an opportunity to offer information, which they did. They provided a project overview and they too explained the project changes uh, that they implemented in response to the design review board's comments. Um, I guess that was in November of 2019. They also um, importantly explained 
the rationale for locating the multifamily units on the lot adjoining Burbank Avenue, explaining that an internal site um, is not financially feasible given the additional costs of development of infrastructure and constraints on access. Uh, there were clarifying questions in, um, that I asked uh, of the project planner and of the applicant and the applicant's design team during their, their presentation. Then um, the hearing was open to the public for comments and a number of people spoke. Um, the vast majority, I think unanimously, um, spoke in opposition and raised a number of issues. Um, the first is that the prod, and, and these are not in priority order or, or um, um, uh, as such, but the, the issues that were raised included the project's impact on neighboring property values, uh, degradation of private property views, the inappropriateness of new residential development uh, of this type, especially with three-story multifamily housing in an area which is uh, developed with larger single family residential lots, one story primarily. And then um, there was a great deal of question about the validity of the exist existing general plan land use designation that calls for this type of um, uh, density, residential density, and, and that um, the environmental impact report for the uh, general plan was out of date. There was also a request for public meet minutes at the meeting um, I uh, responded to those questions uh, directly or when necessary asked for um, members of staff to respond, including the traffic engineer regarding traffic circulation, the need for a, a, um, a, a stoplight at an intersection nearby. Um, based on the, uh, at the conclusion of the public comments, I closed the public hearing and then um, uh, outline the principles of the hearing in terms of the major find the, all the findings that have to be made. And uh, based on uh, coming to the conclusion that the planners recommended uh, uh, findings for the, um, for the project were supported by the evidence in, in the record and the information that was presented at the meeting, I did approve the project I did so, however, with, with um, two modified, two additional or modified condition. One was address the uh, over height, um, one of the multifamily buildings exceeded, I think it's a 35 foot height limit. Um, and that, that was um, a, a requirement. It, it exceeded it by a couple of feet. And, and, and the other was um, a clarification regarding a a fence setback along Burbank Avenue uh, to establish that it could be located less than 15 feet. With that, the action was taken and I informed the, uh, the, the participants of the meeting that this action can be appealed and, and close the public hearing. I'm uh, available for any questions. Great, thank you, Mr. Gustafson. Any questions of... Um... Yeah, Commissioner Peterson. Um, I don't know if this is necessarily for the zoning administrator, but um, what is the uh, required public access to the planning documents for a zoning administrator hearing? Well, uh, as with all matters that go to a public hearing, the public has access to the documents this uh, meeting was held before the COVID shutdown. So it was an in-person meeting. The application um, was noticed for hearing. On that notice, it's, uh, the public's informed that they can contact the project planner and, and see the files um, at least 10 days before the meeting. And then the agenda um, is available at the meeting. Um, the project file is in the room. Um, and uh, and the presentation materials. Anything else, uh, Mr. Gustafson? Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Yeah. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and move on to the applicant presentation. Um, so if you're ready to do that and to give us your names and all that stuff that we might need. <laughs> Just be one second. We're having a technical issue on our side. Be sure. Moment. It looks like we're good to go. This is Joe Ripple with Skellinger Brothers. Am I online? Yes, you're unmuted and ready to go. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Joe Ripple with Skellinger Brothers. In anticipation of the Roseland annexation back in 1997, Skellinger Brothers acquired its first property on Burbank Avenue. We purchased the second property of five acres in 2003 and we added to the properties in the more recent years to create a total of 14.25 acres. In the early days, about 20 years ago, when the annexation of the Roseland District was being explored by the city and county, we anticipated proposing a development of single family homes. We attended numerous community meetings, policy discussions and design workshops held for the Roseland annexation and the Sebastopol Avenue specific plan. We helped with the sentiment surveys and contacted neighbors. In addition to the planning efforts, regional environmental and biological studies were conducted by CEQA experts in the Army Corps of Engineers to ensure responsible development of the area. Skellinger Brothers spent an additional four years conducting site-specific environmental studies required for development of the property. During this time, we were working with our design team to study multiple site plans focused on providing a variety of workforce housing types. As a result of this process, it became apparent that the introduction of an apartment program was necessary to satisfy the density requirements of the site's general plan designation. The plans we're presenting is thoughtfully conceived sorry, the plan we are presenting is thoughtfully conceived to comply with the applicable planning documents and more importantly agrees with the housing goals of the city. The general plan's medium low density residential land use designation, that's a mouthful, allows eight to 13 units per acre. This means that the site at 14.25 acres would allow up to 185 units. We are proposing 138 units. The current plan presents three different workforce housing types and two separate development programs comprised of for sale and rental housing. The rental housing or apartment site is currently under contract to be sold to a partnership of Waterstone Residential and Burbank Housing. Waterstone and Burbank Housing intend to develop the apartment site as 100% affordable. Their development proposal is dependent upon securing the various sources of funding from local, state, and federal programs. In the event Waterstone and Burbank Housing are unable to obtain the necessary financing and develop it as an affordable community, Skellinger Brothers will evaluate its ability to develop the apartment site as a market rate rental community. In either circumstance, 
Skellinger Brothers will satisfy its affordable housing obligation in compliance with the city's inclusionary housing ordinance. Our project has withstood multiple legal challenges. We considered the recommendations from both the design review board and the planning commission and where suitable, we incorporated the suggestions into the design. We worked extremely hard to ensure that our development proposal was consistent with the zoning, Burbank Avenue scenic corridor, the specific plan and the general plan. In summary, the plan we have submitted for your approval is thoughtfully conceived and very much in alliance with the housing goals of the city. I'm gonna turn it over to our design team, architect John Warden, landscape architect Mark Bowers, and our engineering expert, Court Manzel is available uh, at a separate site for any questions you might have. Also present, present is Waterstone Residential Principal, Peter Skellinger, for any questions regarding the affordable housing site. Next slide, please. Um, here you can see the site plan. Uh, this is John Warden. I'm the architect for the project. And I'm here with Mark Bowers, the landscape architect. Here you can see the site plan with the uh, duets at the North Entry Drive, uh, 12 units, the 62 single family dwellings towards the east and center of the project, and the 64 apartment units um, at the Southern Entry Drive. Next slide, please. Uh, this plan, this is Mark Bowers, I'm the landscape architect with resource design. Uh, this plan here represents the street tree program uh, throughout the site. Uh, it's composed of five different species of trees along uh, public roads. It has three species of oaks uh, uh, along Burbank Avenue. There's two of those species of oaks. Um, the idea was a comment from Design Review to incorporate more native oaks into the uh, scenic corridor that's along the Burbank Avenue project. They were also incorporated into corners and intersections uh, where there's more room for that stature of a tree. And then uh, we also have uh, six different species of trees that are understory trees uh, providing diversity for the architectural styles of the different types of units. Next slide, please. Um, this is the apartment site at the, at the Southern Entry Drive. Um, we did a series of studies um, for uh, different locations of the apartment site, um, taking into consideration that the affordable uh, apartment uh, developer needed a clearly identifiable and contained parcel with clear access to the public way. So our two primary sites would be one to the north off the North Entry Drive and one to the south off the uh, the South Entry Drive. We also looked at one in the center immediately behind the two out parcels along Burbank Avenue. The Northern site, um, which is currently the Duet site, is, is too narrow to actually have an efficient apartment uh, development. Um, we had to have an access road along the far Northern side and it needed to be in that location in order to have the mandatory maximum or mandatory separation between the two entry drives for the fire department. Um, the, the center site uh, made it difficult to have this clearly identifiable and contained parcel with clear access to the public way that was desirable um, by, by the apartment developer. And so the southern site ended up being our most ideal site. It, it fronts directly onto Burbank Avenue. It's of a width and proportion that was sufficient to get an efficient apartment project. Next slide, please. Um, this is uh, uh, the site plan of the apartments. It's four buildings um, grouped around uh, parking courts. Next slide, please. Um, this is the initial uh, apartment scheme that we presented uh, last fall to the design review board. Next slide, please. And this is a revision um, in, in response to design review board comments. Um, that lowered the buildings at its at the corners along Burbank Avenue and along the southern side of the project, um, lowering these roof forms to create two-story and some three-story elements that were set back. Next slide, please. And this is uh, the view from Burbank Avenue 
We also reduced the mass of the center portion of the building, lowered the buildings uh, uh, by creating a utility well in the center of the roof forms, um, pushed the, the center portion back and exposed the decks as opposed to having the roof come out and, and cover the decks. Next slide, please. And then along the, the southern edge, created um, uh, an increased setback uh, uh, to allow greater landscaping along the, the back section. Next slide, please. And created um, an undulating roof of some two-story and some three-story elements along that center, uh, along that southern property boundary so that it wasn't a continuously three-story element along the entire southern boundary. Next slide, please. Um, here you can see a bird's eye of the, um, of the project and the distance uh, from buildings on the proposed site to existing neighbors to, to, to the south. Um, next slide, please. Uh, here's the landscape concept plan for the multi-use uh, project. Uh, the main component here was to provide a pedestrian oriented uh, outdoor spaces that could uh, basically work with a number of different age groups. So the idea was to have some, some flexibility uh, outdoor barbecue areas, outdoor seating areas, lots of shade, uh, central mailbox uh, kiosks where people can meet and greet. Um, and then uh, you can see the main component of this plan is down the center. There was a courtyard space there. Uh, one of the comments from design review was to, uh, we had that space fairly well programmed for different age uses of kids. Seating in their suggestion was to keep it on a simpler side of things to let it be more of a flex space and have different types of uses that could take place in there. So that's kind of what we've done there, incorporating the green space in there. And then uh, along the north side of the apartment buildings, there's a series of outdoor spaces uh, with low railings to kind of protect, protect pedestrians from the sidewalk and the roadway patterns or the, or the private access where the driveways and parking are. On the lower left-hand corner there, you can see a view uh, of a sketch looking in down through the corridors and the introduction of a, a tree in there to reduce the scale of the buildings as you look down the corridors where the, the parking access is. Uh, John also, one of the things that we also uh, looked at when we talked to design review was uh, uh, increasing the, the density of planting along the uh, south side adjacent to the existing residential use. And one of the approaches that we did was to shift the whole building uh, to the north, about five feet, and generate a larger parking, uh, a larger planting area along that south boundary. Um, since screening along that side has been crucial um, for the three-story buildings, we also then proposed to install larger scale trees um, in that area of the project so that there would be immediate screening of that structure uh, from the day those trees are planted. And then as you heard earlier, the, there was also the suggestion of, uh, we have a six foot good neighbor fence along that side that aids in the screening. And the suggestion was to add another two feet of that to the top to uh, help with that screening condition. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And here's a view of the central courtyard area that was uh, simplified. So before we had some uh, you know, balance beams in there, some sand areas for play, and now the general idea is to just incorporate a number of seating areas, built-in seat walls for flex seating, uh, and then shade for, uh, for the folks to be able to sit underneath. And then the, the, you can see some of the, north on the, along the north side, then some of the patio areas that have been developed along there for outdoor barbecuing, and then just some passive things as well, just sitting. Next slide, please. Um, uh, this is a, a site plan highlighting the single family dwellings. Next slide, please. Um, and, and, and here we try to uh, create a, a, a standardized floor plan that fits on every lot and then to gain, give diversity to the development by having multiple different upper floors and multiple different roof forms that can, in conjunction with the different siding and different um, color schemes would build diversity into the development. Next slide, please. Here you can see street views of the single family dwellings. 
Next slide, please. So as John mentioned, there was a diversity in the architecture for the single family units. So we have the continuity of the street trees providing a shaded pedestrian uh, kind of atmosphere as you go down the roadways. And then the idea was to create the diversity in the individual lots. And then that landscape and design would then reflect some of the architectural characteristics um, that, that's found in the architecture with a series of the, the street trees carrying the main, the main load of the, the project and then a series of small accent trees that are snugged up more uh, adjacent to buildings, providing screening, some evergreen, and then some accent flowering type of trees. Next slide. And finally, this is uh, the site plan highlighting the duet site up at the North Entry Drive. Next slide, please. These are 12 units um, in, in six pairs uh, in two clusters, uh, clustered around uh, parking courts to get the garages off the street. Next slide, please. And there's a site plan showing how the clustering would work. Next slide, please. And a view from the street um, along uh, with the parking court visible there towards the center. Next slide, please. And a bird's eye view of the same. Next slide, please. One from the, the south, the bird's eye. Next slide, please. So the, the challenge for the, the duets was that you've got six uh, driveways or garage access points. And so the uh, concept for the, that, that plan was to create kind of an auto court uh, feel. And so we have these low walls as you enter off the street to provide some separation from the street. And then as you get into the uh, interior of this courtyard space, the idea was to use some different kind of paving patterns and paving materials to give it more of a courtyard feel than, than a driveway. And then it was uh, strategically placed trees in there to be able to break up the garage and the massing uh, of the, the buildings that all face onto the central courtyard. Next slide, please. I talked a little bit about on the apartment side, the uh, good neighbor fence. That's kind of what you see there in the lower left hand corner. A uh, good neighbor fence is going to be a fence that looks good from both sides, no matter what side of the fence you're standing on. Uh, the section uh, on the lower right, I think, is a good example of the apartment building uh, in relationship to the, the property line. And as you saw in John's, uh, one of John's earlier sketches, the distance from the uh, um, of the existing off-site house to the uh, property line, somewhere in the 50-foot range and all the way to the apartment buildings is at about 106 feet, I think 107 feet. And one of the things I tried to show in this section here is the, the uh, fence screening on one, then the, the location of the, the tree along the property line that then screens the mass of the, the apartment buildings. Uh, if you look just above that, there's an off-site section in the middle of the page. There's an off-site uh, section showing the distance of the house. And you can see there, I put that red line arrow in there because it shows that you don't need a real tall tree uh, in that location to be able to screen up to the 35 foot limit of the, the building. And then uh, the other two uh, sections at the top are just road sections, one through the, through the public road, and then one along Burbank Avenue where I talked about the introduction of the oak species, uh, live oaks and valley oaks to uh, keep in, in, in tune with the scenic uh, corridor along Burbank Avenue. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. That's the end of our presentation. We're available for questions. Okay, so thank you very much for that. Um, and again, uh, commissioners, unless there's a, 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 an immediate clarifying question, let's, because this, there's a lot here, so, okay. Um, all right, so then thanks again for that, and we'll be hearing from you again soon. <laughs> And let's move on to the appellant uh, presentation. All right, this is the host. I just want to let you know that I have given permission to Aaron 
and Mark Henry Parrish. You guys have the permission to speak at your discretion. Uh, hi, Commissioner. Can you guys hear me okay? It's kind of faint um, me for me. How about now? A little better, but not much. Now? No. <laughs> Now. It's still pretty faint and, I, and we really want to hear you, so. Okay, I apologize. Um, you're having some technical difficulties. Uh, how about now? Any better? Uh, you were better a few seconds ago, but you're, I think you're. How about now? That's perfect. Okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, so good evening and thank you for the opportunity to present our appeal this afternoon. My name is Erin Reinberg and I will be presenting our appeal for Residence First Roseland, representing the neighbors of Burbank Avenue, McMinn Avenue and Parish Lane. Next slide, please. Before we move into our presentation, I want to formally state our objection to this meeting occurring and ask for continuance on all decisions concerning our appeals until the COVID-19 restrictions are lifted and all of our neighbors can equally and fairly participate in person as is best for them. We understand that the city has interpreted Governor Newsom's suspensions of parts of the Brown and Bagley Keene Acts for meetings to continue. However, it is still a disservice to our community to move forward with non-essential urgent meetings that could wait until the COVID restrictions are lifted and better allow for full participation. So that all voices can be heard, especially our socioeconomically disadvantaged neighbors without access technology to receive notices and access information online from the city's website, including the meeting information to even call in. Members of the community have asked me to pass this message along as they are unable to attend tonight due to their own limitations. Thank you for your consideration. Next slide, please. I wanted to begin our presentation with grievances against the city, all of its agents, and its blatant ignoring of residents' concerns and our appeals. You have heard in presentations tonight claims that this project fits with the Roseland specific plan and meets guidelines for the priority development area. You have also heard that this plan is for affordable housing and must be located where it's at so that the Schellinger brothers can sell the property to their sister company, Waterstone Housing, in the name of affordable housing. A ruse that fooled this commission on February 13th and has yet to come to fruition as intent is not the same as sold. These presentations show nothing but fallacies, backdoor deals, and a city bent on putting developers over the neighborhood, over Roseland that has no representative voice. What should become clear is that the city believes it has done nothing wrong that the city attorney ignoring notifications that appeals were in process, encouraged the commission to fall sympathetic to the challengers and their supposed affordable housing finance application that needed a rush decision on the February 13th affordable housing meeting. Affordable housing has yet to materialize in any official capacity. What it shows is that the voices of a neighborhood that loves its street, loves its open spaces, loves its diversity, supports appropriate and honest development, and values the importance of nature, fall deftly on city planners and members that see only how to build, build, build. And we're persuaded to move forward with the decision that in turn tied the hands of the design review board during the appeal hearing on 6-4 and shortchanged the neighborhood further. This project doesn't fit the characteristics of the neighborhood as is mandated in the Roseland specific plan and jeopardizes the preservation efforts to keep Burbank Avenue scenic and rural and protect our heritage trees. What has also become apparent in these meetings is a lack of an elected Roseland voice on council and planning boards. This means that Roseland residents have no direct representation and no one fighting for their voices in an audience of representatives that only want to force overdevelopment on our small community under the guise of the priority development area. The city expects Roseland residents to just bend over and take their heartless comments that we just have to deal with change as stated during the February 5th design review meeting with the uh, administrator. But despite multiple neighbors sharing their disdain and again was ignored on the February 13th meeting, while at the same time giving no way for the people of Roseland to elect representation loyal to Roseland and truly invested in our community. How can projects continue to move forward without proper representation? It's been three years since Roseland was annexed into Santa Rosa and still Roseland has no elected representative. Where is our representation? Taking all of this into consideration tonight, we urge this commission to act in the general principle of fairness to revoke the appeal of the minor use permit and push a redesign of the tentative map 
to send this project back to the design review board. Next slide, please. It is clear that the residents of Roseland, and in particular neighbors of Burbank Avenue, McMinn Avenue, and Parrish Lane, but that there's the complete lack of impropriety and collusion among the city and developers. This was witnessed at the February 5th design review board meeting when favoritism was shown to the developers over neighbors demanding that the meeting be stopped in violation of the Brown Act and access to documentation, despite all of the negative comments. It was shown again at the February 13th planning commission meeting when a clear favoritism was shown the Schellinger brothers and their representatives in the name of buzzwords like affordable housing and mixed development. The planning commission was rightfully considering postponing the February 13th meeting decision as the residents drafted their appeals within the allowed time window. However, was swayed by city attorney Crocker after she sat and provided counselor, counsel to the Schellingers during that hearing. City attorney Crocker shows more sympathy to the developers over the residents and violates the ethics of the bar by conversing with the Schellingers during a city meeting to move their agenda forward over the people. That same agenda, those same claims of affordable housing and the selling of the multi-development parcel to Waterford Housing owned by Peter Schellinger and his plea that during that meeting, a vote on the tentative map go forward to secure funding has yet to materialize. As to date, as access to the materials we have, the property remains unsold and is still an intent and nothing is officially designated low income. Where is that urgency? Where is the need to push an agenda that has yet to happen? How is the neighborhood not to look at this favoritism with suspicion and question the ethics of our representatives that seem to forget that they serve the will of the people, not developers? The city and developers cite this specific plan to say that this project fits the characteristics and life of Burbank Avenue and will bring much needed housing. If this is the case, why do so many neighbors oppose it and state the opposite at all these meetings? Why do these voices go, get ignored and the developers every want is approved, including an unmaterialized claim of giving affordable housing? The commission should not have approved a minor use permit or tentative map with knowledge of residents preparing to appeal the zoning commission hearing. So again, tonight, we asked the commission to revoke the minor use permit and trigger redesign of the tentative map approval and uphold our appeal under the general principles of fairness so that this plan can go back to the design review board, who we feel would have made requirements that the multi-unit project be relocated to the center and that the building height be addressed. Instead, their hands were tied because the commission felt compelled to sympathize with the developer and their false claims of affordable housing in the decision on February 13th, thereby limiting the effect of our first appeal and actual change. Sending this project back to the design review board provides an opportunity to work with the developers to best design this plan space for everyone, as residents are not against this project itself, but against location and design that ignores neighbor input and does not match the scale and style of some of the projects around Roseland. Next slide, please. Additionally, the narrative needs to be checked as blatant lies on access continue to be presented to this commission. During the February 13th meeting, Adam Ross addressed concerns brought up about the appeals to the February 5th zoning administrator meeting. The people's claims were that materials were not present during that meeting for the general audience to review, a violation of the Brown Act. Additionally, no meetings were taken during this meeting, which apparently is permissible when all other meetings have notes and minutes. The point here, however, is that Ross stated during the February 13th meeting that he forgot the materials in his office like a grade school student forgetting his homework. However, he quickly changed that story and stated differently on the June 4th appeal meeting and tonight that he had them but just should not present them. What is the truth? Where is the accountability? How is the community to participate when materials are purposely made difficult to obtain? Even a conversation with Burbank Housing tonight. It goes further. Upon request for all materials related to the planned Burbank Avenue subdivision, records in the public access file were purposely held back by Mr. Ross and protection of the Schellingers when Mr. Parrish went in person to view them. Again, the people are prevented from access, and this is apparently okay with the city as they continue to accept Mr. Ross's word. Citing again the general principles of fairness, it should further move this commission that in our appeal, we ask that no meeting be scheduled until we've received all documents pertaining to our extensive records requests. The records requests have been delayed, and to date, all documents are yet to be received. What the city did do was bombard us with documents on June 9th, two days before this hearing, and gave insufficient time for us to fully review everything received to move along with this hearing. There is no fairness in our access, and we ask that our appeal be upheld until all materials may be reviewed. Next slide, please. In a few words, to describe Burbank Avenue, it is a culturally diverse and family-centered community with modest single-family homes and large setbacks of open green space with heritage oak and redwood trees. It's a scenic road, rich in rural heritage and a diverse group of people that are both new and long-term residents. 
And when thinking of characteristics, the dense project proposed here does not match the street and redesign and a new map is needed so that this project does not violate the city's specific plan to contribute to neighborhood character and quality of life as referenced in AH-1.3 of the specific plan. And these pictures are of the neighbor right across the street from the project. Next slide, please. We know that different types of housing are necessary to meet the demands of our city, but the location of multifamily units needs to be done with care so as to best serve future tenants and without taking away from neighborhood characteristics is laid out in the specific plan. I wanted to paint a picture of the new 2017 outlier on Burbank Avenue, the Crossroads apartment put in by Burbank Housing. These are two-story low-income units, two parcels south from the proposed Burbank development we are appealing tonight. These apartments are already larger than the single family homes on Burbank Avenue and do not fit the scenic road with over cemented walkways and small trees, but they were needed to serve our diverse community. All this aside, despite its outlying characteristics, the Crossroads apartments are significantly smaller in scale and style than the proposed multifamily complex right on Burbank Avenue and budding up to Parish Lane residents, sandwiching them in between both multifamily developments. The Design Review Board asked us to consider building height and not just stories. To give context, Crossroads is a 79 unit complex with a building height of roughly 25 feet, whereas this plan would only be 64 units pushed into a denser space and be a colossal 34.4 feet, the highest building on the street and in the surrounding vicinity. Why would anything need to be larger than the Crossroads apartments? How does that match neighborhood characteristics and quality of life as cited in the specific plan? Next slide, please. So we are not against multifamily housing. What we are against is a tentative map that prioritizes the financial gains to be made by the Schellinger selling off the multi-unit zoned region as a more attractive, more profitable location, which forces it to be three stories to meet low-income housing financial goals. Instead of it, instead of as the design review board recommended, spreading out the multi-unit housing into less dense, less tall features, or moving it all together to still get the financing needed. And as I will remind you, this multi-unit, multi-affordable housing that Schellinger's speak of has yet to formally be marked affordable housing or to be officially sold to Peter Schellinger's Waterstone for low-income plans. When the Crossroads apartment plans were brought before the County Planning Commission in 2011, it was presented as a properly represented, contracted, guaranteed low-income housing by Burbank Housing Incorporation. The Schellinger's project is deceitful and misrepresenting its project as low-income housing to stop them from compromising with neighbors. We ask for reconsideration of high density locations on the minor use zoning and other rezoning options on the tentative map. In consideration of neighbors, we request that multi-unit housing be placed at the geographic center of all neighbors on Burbank, McMinn and Parish Lane, a location that Schellinger said was possible, but just not as appealing or profitable. This preserves the scenic road landscape, neighborhood characteristics, and is still in line with providing different types of housing and access. We ask that the Challenger brothers be honest in their reasoning for the location. The response has been, it is more desirable to be on the street. Challenger claimed that they have allegedly planned to sell it to their child company, Waterstone owned by Peter Schellinger. They're still gonna profit no matter what to build the multi-unit apartment complex in league with Burbank housing. However, as to date, on record shared, no sale has gone through and there's no documentation of financing there by invalidating claims of affordable housing. Intent is not sold. Since this property hasn't been sold, there is no reason why it could not be moved by revoking a tentative map other than to better line the pockets of the developer. And there is no reason it cannot be at a smaller height to at the very least match the neighboring Crossroads apartment height, whether we loan the surrounding new projects on Special Road in 12th and Dutton Avenue in Hearn. This was advocated by the Design Review Board at the hearing on June 4th where the only response was it makes it hard to get low income funding. Again, this project is not affordable housing and it has not been sold as such. It was also suggested that if the map could not be redesigned, that the units be expanded to meet the two story height, which would eat into the profit margins of the single family residents plan next to it. It is all about profit, not compromise, not being truthful about affordable housing options under contract. Again, we asked the commission to listen to the voice of the neighborhood and consider our appeal to the minor use permit and tentative map and send this project back to the design review board so that the apartment complex can be moved to the geographic center in fairness to all residents. Next slide, please. We also ask that the redesign of the tentative map take into consideration the addition of mandatory green spaces within this project. There's a park shortage in Roseland, even with the planned neighborhood. 
and with more density from all housing types should also come parks. This is in line with a similar scale development already underway, Paseo Vista on Dutton Avenue. This development is required to put in three parks by the city and is also 14 acres. You can see the similarity in the plans here. The tentative map for this project can be redesigned to require the same, thereby bringing outdoor space, preserving the scenic road and heritage trees, and benefiting current and future residents alike. Next slide, please. During the 6-4 meeting, board members brought to attention the unique qualities of Burbank Avenue and a genuine worry that overdevelopment would ruin the road as a scenic corridor. We need better reports that truly take into account our environment and animals that also call Burbank Avenue home. Additionally, the city hides behind a blanket report for all development in Roseland based on a 2016 CEQA study. Since 2016, we have had fires, floods, and changing weather patterns that should trump this blanket resolution. The residents have repeatedly asked for a fair and unbiased ERR, not one funded by the developer as they disc their plot, that looks at the environmental impact, especially in regards to the tiger salamander, as well as a truthful traffic study that also takes into account all the reports of negligence to the police and city as people continue to flood Burbank Avenue, driving well over the 25 per mile per hour speed limit. Next slide, please. Again, we are not against development or multi-unit housing. We are against corruption and sweetheart dealings between city planners and developers. We are against developers claiming affordable housing to move their agenda when in fact none actually exist. Intent is not confirmation. Intent is not sold. We are against city attorneys advising developers and pleading the developer's case when residents were moving for appeal. We ask again, under the general principles of fairness, that you take a truthful look at the plan, design and map to see that it does not meet the guidelines of the Roseland Specific Plan does not improve the quality of neighborhood and needs serious redesign and rezone maps before it can move forward. We ask you to listen to our appeal and to revoke the minor use permit and tentative map so that this project can go back to the design review board and developers can be forced to work with neighbors in creating a compromise that benefits all. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you. Um, very impressive online presentation. <laughs> very impressive. Um, again, I think it's best to hold questions and go on. The applicant now has a five minute um, response time if they're ready to do that. You'd be responding to the appellant's uh, presentation. Uh, this is Joe Ripple with Skellinger Brothers. We really have no comment. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ripple. Um, so with that, we're going to go ahead and move on to the public uh, public hearing. Um, I'm going to open the public hearing again. If you're if you're coming in through Zoom, you're going to choose your little raise hand uh, feature. If you're dialing in, you would dial in uh, star nine to be uh, included in the list. When it's your turn, uh, the host will give you permission. Uh, make sure you unmute yourself. Give your name for the record. You're going to have three minutes. Uh, again, the timer uh, will count down. You'll see that on the screen and uh, you'll be muted after three minutes. Uh, please be aware that if you're part of the uh, appellate team, you can't speak twice. So you would not be allowed to speak again under public comment if you're part of the appellant uh, team. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, our recording secretary and host to see if there are any uh, public comments. I'm opening the public hearing. Just give us one second so we can get that uh, presentation up. And it looks like we'd be calling Efren Carrillo first. If you can just give us a second, Efren, and then we'll give you permissions to speak once we're ready.
Um, so I'm having trouble getting the clock to display. All right, Ethan, I just changed your permissions. Are you able to unmute yourself and test your mic? Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much, uh, Chairwoman Cisco, members of the Planning Commission. This is Efren Carrillo with Burbank Housing, uh, an affordable housing uh, developer that's been around here in Sonoma County based uh, in Santa Rosa for the last 40 years. Uh, we have had the great uh, privilege and opportunity of building uh, multifamily rentals that currently uh, have uh, uh, over 10,000 residents living in our communities. Uh, we have built over 70 uh, different development communities uh, in and around Santa Rosa and throughout the entire North Bay. As a committed affordable housing developer, uh, we are also committed to the partnership with Waterstone and the development, uh, certainly subject to securing the financing. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, certainly happy to answer them from the commission and or staff. Uh, simply wanted to uh, be on the record once again on behalf of Burbank Housing a long time affordable housing developer in the community uh, and uh, committing to partner with Waterstone for the development of the low income housing units uh, on this site. Uh, thank you very much and certainly happy to answer any questions. Chair Cisco, that was the only hand that we have raised and it doesn't appear any others have raised in the meantime. Okay. Um, okay, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, close the public hearing. And um, I think we need to take about a 10 minute break um, before we go on to questions because that, that could be expensive. So how about if we stop and reconvene about 6.10. So just go ahead and mute and stop your video and um, we'll reconvene at 6.10.
Hello, commissioners. This is the recording secretary, Mike. I just want to see if you can all get your cameras back on so I know when we are ready to start this thing. All right, thank you, commissioners. We're ready when you are. Great, thank you. <clears throat> um, since, since the applicant did not have a response to the appellant, um, I wanna check and see, are there any questions from the commission for the appellant before we move on to questions to the applicant? Okay, not seeing any right now, all right. So um, I'd like to bring the applicant forward again and commissioners questions of our applicant. Vice Chair Weeks. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, is it possible for the um, height of the buildings to be lowered anymore? That's one question. And then the second question has to do with the grant that you talked about the last time you were before us and that it, you were applying for an infill grant from the state. And I wondered if that actually had occurred and the status of that. Um, I can uh, deal with the first question. This is John Warden again, the architect. Um, I can deal with the first question and I'm gonna pass it on to for the second question. Um, we did we did study the two-story uh, solution um, subsequent to the design review board meeting uh, last week, um, and what it, what it ends up doing is it ends up stretching the um, the apartment development all the way along the southern boundary of the project, um, keeping the same width, but but stretching along the southern boundary um, up to the point where there's just one row of houses along the eastern property boundary. Um, that um, precludes uh, the, the connecting road that is a requirement uh, to, to the connecting road to the south um, without bifurcating the apartment project itself with a public street, um, which uh, is less desirable as far as the, the apartment developer is concerned. Um, and in addition to that, we lost eight single family houses, um, work, eight of the single family workforce houses. Hi, uh, uh, Vice Chair Weeks, this is Peter Skellinger with Waterstone. To answer your question as it relates to the infill infrastructure grant, IIG grant that we mentioned the last time, um, a couple things occurred. Um, we, uh, we prepared the application and uh, we had communication with HCB and they determined that, or they, their feedback was that our project was not dense enough to be competitive uh, with the other applications that were being submitted uh, in Santa Rosa, specifically uh, a group of projects that came together uh, for the downtown uh, application. So uh, we did not move forward with that. Um, and then the other complication was is that we were under appeal. So um, uh, we could have uh, we could have submitted um, with with that caveat and, and, and seen how they responded to that, but we uh, elected not to fulfill that uh, application given the feedback we received about the density. So you weren't aware of the density issue when you came to us the last time on February 13th? We, we weren't, yeah, good question. We were not aware of the other projects that were submitting in, in a, a, a group effort downtown uh, and, and clearly they would be more, more dense than we would be and they would score higher. Thank you. Yes. Anyone else? Question of the applicant. Yes, Commissioner Carter. Are, are there other, other avenues of public uh, funding that are being pursued to ensure the uh, completion of the affordable element with the uh, uh, not going forward with the original grant application? 
Uh, this is Peter Skellinger again, Commissioner Carter. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, yes, uh, we've actually submitted to the Housing Authority, the City of Santa Rosa's Housing Authority, um, for assistance through project based vouchers that um, they issued an RFP. Uh, uh, about a month ago, um, and uh, we uh, will be uh, uh, in front of them on the 22nd um, for that request. And then we intend, um, depending, of course, on the outcome of, of tonight and our city council hearing, to prepare an application for the July 1st 9% uh, disaster relief tax credit round. Uh, we also are preparing applications for the September uh, MHP application round as well. Any other questions? Yes, Commissioner Kaya. Hi, um, can you talk through a little bit about why, um, why you, or why it's important to entitle this as uh, market rate and then kind of go the affordable, to build the affordable, whether it's with Burbank or whoever um, on the back end and kind of how that ties into the, the financing of the project overall. Yes, uh, great question, Commissioner Kalia. Um, Peter Skellinger again, Waterstone. Uh, the, um, we worked through, uh, well, Skellinger Brothers, the applicant, and, and, and I was participating in, in the conversations with staff. We worked through the element of um, if we identified the multifamily site as affordable, there would have to be some type of covenant that required it, um, that the multifamily site be, be developed as, as an affordable, you know, in, in, in perpetuity. So uh, the challenge that, of course, the master plan developer would have, Skellinger Brothers, would what what would happen if you could not secure your financing and you could not uh, proceed in closing the property? Then we would be stuck with an affordable site that you know we we couldn't develop uh, because the financing just wasn't available. So the solution we came up with was. We, we have site control, so we, we can close on the property. That's our intent. We're under contract with them uh, through 2021. That allows us to go through applications this year and next. Um, if we're unsuccessful, then we'll have to drop the, uh, the contract. Um, and then, as, as Joe Ripple mentioned earlier, Skellinger Brothers will satisfy their inclusionary requirements through whether it's on-site, mixed use uh, apartment development, uh, mixed income, excuse me, apartment development, or in inclusionary housing fees, whatever that may be, they, they understand they are gonna have to uh, satisfy their inclusionary housing requirement. So, so that technical aspect of it required us to proceed uh, as a market rate housing project. And it really came out in the very end when we started working through the technicalities of the phasing and how, how that would work um, uh, in preparation to go to design review board and and, and then uh, the ZA. Any other questions of the applicant? Okay, I have one. Um, um, Mr. Skellinger, could you go through again um, what went into the the choosing the space for the multifamily units? I watched the design review board meeting and I heard some things that are in conflict with what I'm hearing Mr. Gustafson say, which was that he was told it was not financially feasible to put them there. I heard at design review that it had nothing to do with financing. It had nothing to do with finance, uh, infrastructure or phasing that it was a want. So could you go through how, why that, uh, th that other more centrally located place um, wasn't chosen? Sure. Uh, again, uh, Chair Cisco, Peter Skellinger. Uh, I'm, I'm, to be candid with you, I'm a little bit confused about 
the comments you're making as it relates to the design review board, because uh, we've tried to be fairly consistent. Um, the, the finance, the, the issue that we brought up at the appeal hearing, it, it, the nuance is, is that um, it is related to, if you go into the center of the site, it is related to the infrastructure. What I was saying at the, at the appeal hearing is the, the nuance is uh, the financing for the affordable housing project has to con uh, has to contemplate the total outlays of of the, the the capital right we the affordable housing project would eventually get reimbursed if it was if the project was located in the center and we had to put in all the infrastructure in advance of the single family being developed it would get reimbursed by the uh, single family once it was developed that's a common tool that the city uses in the reimbursement agreements, right? Infrastructure reimbursement agreements. But the, the difference is, is that when you go to the tax credit investors, they don't, they don't contemplate a credit that comes in. It's just not how it works. So it's a little different than market rate development. So that's the nuance that we were talking about that, yes, we, we, would, we could finance it, but the concern is it's already at over, Five hundred thousand dollars a unit, and it's getting really expensive, regardless. Because we're we're thinking that we have to do prevailing wage. Uh, there's just all the, the storm drain issues are out there, so it's just getting expensive, and we're very concerned about loading it up with additional infrastructure that we would only receive a credit for in the future once single family is developed. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And and then the other comment um, that concerned me was after it was stated that it wasn't about financing, it wasn't about infrastructure, it wasn't about phasing, it was a want. It was also stated that it, that you wanted it to be a standalone project. So could you say more about that? Yes, that is absolutely the truth. Uh, that is without question a want. Um, I, I think, let, let me back up. I think they're both wants because it makes our, our project more feasible. Um, but the nuance in the, on the infrastructure is, is what I uh, previously communicated. The, the standalone element that you're referring to and, and, and that uh, John Warden, our architect, discussed is it's a different financing. Um, it's a different ownership. So the single family will be developed through that, whatever entity builds that. Um, but the multifamily, because it's a tax credit uh, financing structure, will be developed independent uh, of, of the single family. So it has to be standalone um, because it's, it's a separate entity. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, John makes a good point. I mean, you, you're talking about for sale housing compared to rental housing. Those are two different complete operations as well. And, and so had the intent not been to make it affordable housing and the intent to make it market rate housing, would it have been easier to locate those units um, more centrally to the project? I, I don't think, um, well, I, I can't speak for, for, for the applicant, uh, Skellinger Brothers, but um, um, I, I can say if, if you're asking if, if the apartments, if it was a market rate project, if the apartments could be located in the center of the site, um, it's still it's it's still a phasing question. So it'd be, you know, how does that work? But, um, you know, it, it wouldn't have the same complications as it relates to the, to the uh, financing and the ownership of it. But, you know, the, the team saying here that, the, you know, at the end of the day, you know, what Skellinger Brothers identified, I think at the design review meeting is, it still impacts a neighbor, whether it's the Southern neighbor or the two out parcels, you know, or it's located on the Eastern side, they analyze that and it still impacts neighbors. Well, yeah, it, it would if it was located where the cul-de-sac is, but if had it been located where, um, where our appellant was, was 
uh, it wouldn't impact the people that you're building for. No, it would have impacted the two neighbors. If, if you look at where. Oh, it, I don't think, well, you can speak to that. I don't think that would work. <laughs> you could, you could figure out the infrastructure. Um, yeah. They, I mean, yeah. I, yeah. Let's, let's let John Ward speak to that. Okay. Um, I, I, I think it would be far less restrictive if, if it were all uh, uh, market rate, like you were implying. Um, but um, the, the, even, even if it were all market rate and surrounding it with single family houses in a relatively narrow band all the way around it would be, would be difficult to actually make it, make it work very well. Um, it, it, it's not impossible, obviously, you could do it but it, it would be difficult to make it work and to function. Okay, great, thank you. Um, any other, yes, Commissioner Duggan. So uh, talking about the multifamily units uh, still, was there um, consideration given to flipping the existing location so that the carports were on the north side of the buildings? So they're not along the fence line next to the um, adjacent neighbor. Yes, we we did we did look at that, um, and the the reason there were several reasons that we chose to go the way we are going. Um, number one, so that as you're driving by the project, um, entering the project along the south uh, entry drive, that it was an attractive thing to to drive past that you'd be able to see the ends of buildings as opposed to um, the back end of carports. Um, and then um, in addition to that, it, the, um, the, uh, the, the setback um, between the, the three-story building, the two and three-story buildings and the property line would, was substantially greater by putting the parking along the Southern property boundary than if we flipped it. If we flipped it, it put the, the three-story buildings only 20 feet from from the the southern property boundary, as opposed to the the 60, 70 feet that it is currently. Okay. Any other questions? Um, yes, Mr. Kaya. Sorry, my question is actually, I think, more for staff than it is for the applicant. But I just want to get clarity if the the design review board's um, recommendation of increasing the good neighbor fence to two uh, from six feet to to eight feet is included in the conditions of approval, or if we would need to condition that. Uh, Adam Ross here. Uh, those conditions would be uh, in the uh, their consideration conditions, and they'd be included in the design review permit uh, resolution. So that would so that would not be something that we would need to do. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you, Commissioner Carter. Did you have a question? Yeah, I was hoping Adam could perhaps put the slide that Commissioner Collier just referenced back up. If that's possible. The recommendations from the most recent design review. Yeah, if um, uh, Secretary, uh, Ad, uh, Planning Commission Secretary can, can bring up the, uh, the staff presentation. In the meantime, I'll try and formulate my question here. Um, what of that list of um, recommendations do you anticipate uh, becoming part of a design review permit? So um, that's a good question. Uh, I would say that the... Um, uh, that that would be a better answer uh, for the applicant to respond to, for the fence uh, for the fence height uh, as well. Is, is staff recommending any of these uh, recommendations? 
Well, there are four considerations for the final design review, uh, which is uh, uh, to, the, to staff. Commissioner Carter, this is uh, Claire Hartman, Deputy Director of Planning. Did, did that answer your question? Did well, I, I was hoping to see the list again. It, it's not in the uh, PowerPoint that I have available otherwise. And, and I, I wanted to hear from the applicant of, of those recommendations, what are, are they considering? And okay. I, and staff will take a look at, it's been a combination of entitlements and fencing has come up and I think every entitlement. So I think if we could take a minute our, from the staff side and take a look at our exhibits and make sure that we know where each fence recommendation lies and from and in what authority it came onto the entitlement package. Um, but yes, the applicant can also respond. Commissioner Carter, uh, actually Chair Cisco and commissioners, this is Bill Rose. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I'll just add a little to this while staff is uh, pulling up the slides. So the design review board, uh, I serve as the liaison to the board. What they frequently do on their conditions is they will give kind of uh, two options. One will be a consideration or a suggestion where they still give some design um, room for the applicant team. And then they will have c conditions that are the shells. And those are both of those are usually through a discussion with the applicant. So the applicant understands the conditions and um, on the considerations, they will truly do that. And sometimes they come back and say, um, we considered it, we were not able to implement it for X reasons, or we came back with an alternative that we think satisfies it, or they will simply implement it in its entirety. And then the shells are those that they, they agree to actually implement. So I just wanted to add a little background to the specific language and how those conditions get developed at the design review board. Um, and then as staff has stated, I think the applicant um, can give the commission some feedback as to how they um, are intending to address those conditions from the design review board. Um, this is John Warden um, for, for the applicant. Um, the, the, the fence issue, consider adding a two foot fence extension. We're com completely uh, amenable to that on the south side, on the south side and um, the, uh, the, the, the further consideration was that it be done in conjunction with the Southern neighbors to make sure that they wanted that to happen. Um, and so uh, we agreed to that as well. Uh, considering adding the Valley Oak trees, we are doing that. Uh, considering the two-story approach, we did consider the two-story approach and ran, ran into s some, some issues. Um, consider heritage protection throughout the site. We, we are, are in agreement with that. The heritage trees along Burbank Avenue that are are slated to be removed are being removed for the Burbank Avenue uh, right of way improvements, the bicycle path and the sidewalk and other other things that were dictated by the city. Um, consider increasing the diversification of trees throughout the site. We're doing that as well. So I'm almost done here. Uh, so the last two bullets there, the heritage protection and increased diversification of trees. Um, were those represented in what your landscape architect presented today? The heritage trees, uh, there's a couple of those there. The one that he talks of the first bullet item, adding additional valley oak trees, that one was, uh, he, uh, one of the board members on the design review wanted to add one specific tree of alley oak in the center of the apartment complex along Burbank. And we agreed to that. Not that, that that's not currently being shown on that plan, but we agreed to that. And then as far as the diversification of the trees throughout the site, that's what I described to you uh, earlier with the uh, diversity of the street trees, uh, the accent trees, and then the, uh, the three varieties of, of oaks. 
Okay, thank you. Um, waiting for it to get back to our screen, but um, I have another question about the uh, two-story uh, consideration. I know that you did, after concept review, you managed to modify the height of, of some of those units and, and, and changed up some of the elements. What, and I hear you can't lengthen the building because that's going to create a, a problem with the existing uh, plan for infrastructure, et cetera. But what consideration was given to lowering the, the height uh, of, of the existing buildings in some form or fashion beyond what you've already done uh, to get some sort of uh, two-story two elements? Uh, we, we, we did do the two-story scheme that stretched across the whole southern boundary. That, that since the planning commission meeting last Thursday, that's the only thing that I was, I was able to get done. Um, so I did do that study. Um, beyond beyond that, we 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 haven't re really considered any anything else at this point. But, but can you and that's something that that would be you'd be able to consider. I mean, just the the height, the two story sort of issue is is kind of the the big one, and I'm wondering. I get that you can't extend the building and make it longer, but what other considerations can you make or will you be making between now and the next um, of cementing the design review into place? Hi, uh, uh, Chair Cisco. It's Peter Scalinger again from Waterstone. Um, let me just try to make sure that uh, I understand your question. Um, it, are you are you asking if we went down if we we have held the same site configuration um, and just reduced it down to two stories? Well, I, under, I understand that that would cost you some units, but I'm talking about per, what other sort of artistic things could you do to bring down the actual height from 35 down to something that's more uh, more in line with a two story um, visual? Well. Um, without compromising your units um, it's 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 pretty difficult to go beyond what i did do um I, what i did do was i i removed some of the tuck under parking which allowed me to lower the units and still maintain the unit count um you know at at the minimum level that we we consider to be uh, necessary um so that that was uh, something that i was able to do um i could continue to take that tact and have more covered parking along the southern boundary by reducing some of the additional uh, tuck under parking. But by that, in, in that way, I'd be reducing the parking count below what I feel comfortable with in this particular location. So uh, it, it's sort of a, a push and shove kind of thing. And it, it's difficult to come up with anything beyond what we've done already that wouldn't change the unit count without changing the site configuration. Okay. Any other questions of the, yes, Mr. Peterson. Uh, I wanna go back just to a couple questions. Uh, so just so I'm clear, and, and I, this will dovetail with a question for staff, which I can, I can hold off on. Um, the, Backstop to all of the affordable housing financing and other schemes falling through is Santa Rosa's inclusionary housing ordinance, correct? Uh, so, so you, I'm sorry, so you're asking if, uh, if this project doesn't move forward with affordable financing and they, they develop it at market rate, they would still have to uh, comply with the inclusionary housing ordinance? Right. I, I want to. What's what's the floor for uh, affordable units that that would be set either by whatever scheme or Santa Rosa ordinance? Okay. Um, it would it would be in lieu fees, um, or it would uh, provide a percentage of on site affordable. Um, if you give me a few minutes, I can potentially get you that specific number for projects such as this. Uh, the number would be great. 
Okay, I'll work on getting you that. Any other questions of the applicant before we move on? Okay, so um, we'll move on to questions of staff. Staff's already working on Commissioner Peterson's question. Any other question? Yes, Vice Chair Weeks. I probably, let me ask this, but I might need to wait until Adam finishes his calculations. Um, <clears throat> one of the comments by the appellant had to do with parks and open space in the project. And so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about any required open space for the project. And then also the appellant alleged that they were still um, waiting for documents. And I wondered if you could enlighten us a little about that. Thank you. Yeah, um, as we work on getting you the numbers for the inclusionary housing uh, requirements, um, the I'll start with the the last question. I may ask you to repeat the the, the second one, but the the I'm not quite sure which documents uh, the appellant is uh, asking for. Um, they've never clarified which ones they uh, say were redacted. Um, as part of the agenda package here today and previous ones, um, you have the you have all the environmental documents that were submitted with the project, um, which includes a wetland de delineation study, uh, biological resource assessment. Uh, again, the cultural resource assessment was redacted uh, per um, state law, um, and um, there's an air quality analysis included. There's a traffic impact analysis included. Uh, those are all public record. We're always in the file and, and able to view. Um, so, uh, so, and, and it's, so that's that's what that's what's included with the file. Everything we have. I'm not sure what other documents they'd be referring to. Um, and then I have uh, that number, which is for the inclusionary housing would be 10% um, uh, for, for the for sale units and 8% uh, rental low income or for rental uh, or 5% of very low income. So the requirement would be for the multifamily rentals, 8% if it's low income designation or 5% of the units at very low income, 10% uh, for the for sale units. And then you had one more part of that question, Vice Chair Weeks? Uh, yes, and then I also have a question about what you just responded to Commissioner Peterson about. Um, so my the first part of my first question was um, they uh, the appellant talked about open space, and I wondered if there was any open space required. So um, there are uh, certain private open space requirements and design guidelines. Um, small lot subdivisions require. Uh, I think it's 400 square feet of semi-private open space for the uh, single family units. Um, and then um, uh, some of the design guidelines ask for things like uh, uses for um, teenagers, uses for uh, 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 child, uh, toddlers, um, and then in between that. Uh, so, those are guidelines. They're not specific requirements. Um, the applicant has provided certain um, certain elements of those guidelines. Um, and as far as uh, parks go, that there, there are park in uh, park fees required for for all all projects. Um, and this project was uh, referred to the Recreation and Parks Department with the City of Santa Rosa, um, who provide oversight of the designation of, of where parks are placed throughout the city. Um, and then, uh, and yeah, and um, that's, I hope that answered your question. Uh, yes, it does. And so then my question about the numbers for the um, uh, for sale units. Um, so they, they would be for sale to moderate income, uh, the ones that would be under the uh, in lieu or under the density bonus or whatever you want to call it contract now? 
Uh, it'd be for lower. <laughs> oh, they'd will, be for them. That would be one way to achieve the inclusionary housing requirement. But um, maybe the applicant can provide a little more information there. Thank you. This is Joe Ripple with Skellinger Brothers. For the for sale, we would do in lieu fees, uh, vice chair weeks, and for the uh, multifamily units, uh, it would be on site. Okay. Any other questions of staff? Yes, Commissioner Duggan. Okay, this, uh, it's kind of a general question, but it speaks to one of the, um, the uh, reasons for the appeal. So what's our, the general policy of informing um, an adjacent neighbor if a development is going forward and it's got a provision for a street that is going to, um, you know, at some point in the future, potentially, if it gets developed, um, you know, cross their property? Do we notify people ahead of time, or is it just on a plan that they might stumble over, or what, what do we do about that as far as our circulation plans? Do they just have to know where to look and what to look for? Uh, Commissioner Duggan and the uh, rest of the Planning Commission, this is Bill Rose again. Uh, I'll take a crack at that one. So. Uh, Notification or making um, different people aware of potential street development, it can come through a number of ways. One is obviously the general plan, the circulation plan will, will uh, show future street connections and roadway networks that are planned. That's one way to do it. Um, as we all know, you know, people may not be just on their own looking through the general plan. So it often comes through the de development process. A project comes in and what we do, uh, we offer a number of different notifications. The very first will be the notice of application. So a project comes in and we simply send a notice that says to the neighbors and they fall within the radius that we send all of our public hearing notices uh, within. There's a project that's been submitted. Please come in and look at the file um, and we can answer questions. And then it, it carries through all the way um, as we go through the development re review process. A actually, it begins with the neighborhood meeting. I should, um, I said that it's the notice of application, but it's really the neighborhood meeting that starts it, that it's the notice of application. And then it's any subsequent public meeting or public hearing. We send the mailed notices, we do the on-site signs, uh, we will do no newspaper publications for public hearings. And so that's generally how people become aware of planned roadways. Sometimes then with the developments where it's not necessarily a planned roadway through the general plan, it will just come through the design of the project. Um, but that's why we, we make those plans available and can ask, answer any questions neighbors may have. So there's, there's nothing that if you have two adjacent neighbors to a particular parcel and a roadway might impact both parcels, you don't t talk to them individually and specifically about a particular plan that might come forward. Maybe if you could, I want to make sure I understand the question. So if a proposed roadway is coming uh, via, say, the general plan, is your question, how do we let those people know that it's planned in the future? Well, this particular site has a roadway that's, that runs north-south, and it looks like it kind of lines up with an existing roadway a couple of parcels down that runs north-south, and it would um, bisect a site owned by the appellant. And was the appellant told specifically and individually that like this is the long range plan for this area? So it does occur where there are planned roadways that that, uh, that are configured in this fashion. Um, and as I mentioned, it often comes through with the general plan and, and in some instances it's not 
uh, well understood until a development pro proposal comes through. So it can be the general plan or the specific plan. Those are public processes. The commission knows knows that well. Um, I I may also ask if uh, either Gabe Osborne or Rob Sprinkle can um, speak to how those networks are determined and configured and the public process for that. Um, so if they're available, I'd like to, to see if we can get a few words from them. Uh, this is Gabe Osborne. I'll go first and let Mr. Sprinkle fill any gaps. Um, so typically the way it works is the general plan does lay out those general roadway alignments, but the general plan design is very difficult to understand if it falls on any certain parcel. That's essentially a big map. It's showing kind of general location and, and the overall concept of where a roadway may go. So there is the overall communication process with the community on that front. Um, but as I mentioned, sometimes it's very difficult for a resident to understand where that road is going to fall. And it usually takes development to begin in that area before we understand where it's going to fall. Um, and we really have a prime example in this situation is that North-South Connector really moved a little bit with the Burbank development to the south. It slid a little further to the west. So basically what happens is we rely on the general plan communication. Sometimes we get a little more detail through specific plans because that roadway is, is shown on the Roseland specific plan as well. And then really what happens is the first development comes in, we start to look at pinning down that circulation. So those are more development specific circulation plans. So we start looking at where it goes and then sometimes the developer is required to start laying out those circulations to at least give the adjacent residents a concept on how it can work. Um, because circulation sometimes shifts development to development, so it isn't necessarily concrete and those roadway alignments can change. Uh, but typically the communication, as we start basically getting that information out to the residents, a lot of times those concerns do come in because they start seeing roadway stubs and they want to understand what that circulation looks like. So if it's not a direct connection between those roads, we usually ask for additional information to help people understand what potentially could happen when they develop. And that's usually the important point in the whole thing. It's pretty rare in those situations that the city pushes the roadway through, usually materializes with future development. But as Mr. Rose mentioned, uh, most of the communication with the residents is through those three pro processes. So either the general plan, the specific plan, or any specific development that takes place in the area that has a general circulation plan with it. And with that, I'll let Rob Sprinkle take over if I've missed anything. I concur with uh, Mr. Osborne's uh, description entirely. Thank you. Okay, anything else from staff? Yes, Commissioner Peterson. I've just got a uh, couple, I think, hopefully quick kind of clarification questions. Uh, one has to do with the scenic roadway designation. And I just want to make sure that I'm understanding that combining district uh, overlay kind of correctly, which is that the, the scenic roadway does not prohibit having a structure over 25 feet. What it governs is the setbacks from the roadway that are determined by the height of that structure. Is that right? That's correct. And um, thank you for that. This, the second one, I, I apologize if I missed it while I was while I was looking at the materials. Um, did we get clarification on what was requested by the applicants and provided to them on six nine, the documents that they referenced? I think that would be for the, the appellants to answer. Is that is that right? Oh, excuse me, appellants. Hi, yes, uh, we sent a comprehensive records request for all documents and records pertaining to the Schellinger Burbank Avenue subdivision at addresses 1400, 1690, 1720, and 1780, including parcels numbers 125 335 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 
stored in any format or method, including but not limited to electronic mail, email, memoranda, reports, studies, analyses, contracts, agreements, checks, charts, graphs, data sheets, computer disks, data processing cards or tapes, DVDs, CDs, notes, work paper, entries, letters, telegrams, telecopies, including faxes, advertisements, brochures, circulars, catalogs, tapes, records, bulletins, papers, books, pamphlets, accounts, photographs, calendars, or diaries. And then we added, if you do not have custody or control of the original, the term document or document shall also include any carbon or photogenic or other copies, reproductions, or fastenals thereof. If you have custody or control of the original and copies, reproductions, or fastenals, the term document or document shall mean the original or any copy of reproduction that is in any way different from the original. And we have yet to receive all of that information. The city, as of tonight, was still sending us stuff. Um, and I, I, app, the appellant or staff can weigh in on this. So that, that sounds to me like a California Public Records Act request. Is, is that right? Correct. So this isn't the, the packet, the development packet that gets posted on the, the agenda? This was, yeah, this is an addition. We wanted every single document to review in drafting our appeals, and we have yet to receive those. And uh, again, this may be a question for staff. Um, you know, it's, it's a little bit different, a little bit outside of our normal wheelhouse. Um, I know there's, there's statutory response times. Were, were those met or was there an exception in this case? If, if you can disclose or if you know. I will turn that over to staff, but as of our knowledge, um, no, that was not met in time. Hi, this is Ashley Crocker, Assistant City Attorney. Um, the City Clerk's Office generally handles and responds to Public Records Act requests and uh, may be providing documents on a rolling basis as they become available. I don't know which documents specifically are at issue, but I will say that uh, certain cultural resources reports cannot be disclosed if they reveal um, locations of sacred sites, for example. And if any documents were copyrighted, for example, uh, plans or soils report or some engineering reports that have the stamp of the architect or engineer affixed to the documents, those cannot be released until such time as the city first um, receives written authorization by affidavit from those engineers or architects to release those documents. So uh, generally speaking, those are some of the types of issues that will um, perhaps result in some documents uh, coming after the original batch of documents is provided. Thank you. That's exactly what I was looking for. Okay, any other questions of staff? Okay, um, so before I bring it back to the commission, um, perhaps Mr. Ross, you could go over again, what are our options tonight? just so we have those in mind as we do our discussion. Yeah, the uh, the commission can deny the appeal, approve the project. The commission can condition the project um, as they see fit. I think the, um, uh, and then you can uh, require, uh, you can send it back to the ZA, you can uh, uphold the appeal and deny the project. And um, and uh, yeah, and I think if uh, Bill, if you can, if there's anything I, I missed there, if you can follow up. Sorry, could you repeat that, Adam? I was trying to do one other thing. Yeah, so the commission can uphold the appeal, deny the project, deny the appeal, prove the project. They also have the opportunity to uh, condition the project um, and can also uh, apply new conditions to the project as, a, as you see fit. Um, and, uh, um, and yeah. Yeah, I would agree with those different uh, options. I think the one thing to consider uh, what we often will see is if the commission has any specific conditions they'd like to add tonight, as this is a de novo hearing, um, that the 
there's a, a discussion, a clear understanding from the applicant team that they um, they understand the conditions and that they uh, are acceptable. Uh, so that would be the only additional request that I would recommend for the commission. Okay. So with that, let's go ahead and bring it back to the commission. Um, would somebody like to read the resolution for the purposes of discussion? You can just wave me when you're ready and unmute and read. <laughs> okay, Vice Chair Weeks, you can do it. Okay. Um, Resolution of the Planning Commission of the City of Santa Rosa denying the appeal and approving a conditional use permit to allow Burbank Avenue subdivision, a 75 parcel small lot subdivision with attached housing located at 1400 Burbank Avenue, assessor's parcel numbers 125-331-003, 125-331-003, one two five dash three six one dash zero zero six one two five dash three six one dash zero zero seven file number PRJ one nine dash zero three one CUP nineteen dash oh nine five and wait for the reading. And do I have a second? Second. Okay, so that was moved by Vice Chair Week seconded by Commissioner Kalia and Vice Chair Week, you want to start our discussion? Sure. Um, how do I want to, how do I want to start this? Um, I think, I'm sorry it came to this, that, um, you know, the project had to be, that the project was appealed um, but I am in support of the project continuing. Uh, you know, we've asked a lot of questions tonight about different options, such as the height and the fence and all of that. Um, and uh, I, I'm clear that um, no, I don't even know how to say this, but I, I, I am going to be supportive of the project. Um, and uh, my, with the additions that the design review board added um, that we already talked about. And I don't know if that falls under our resolution or if that would go to when the council reviews it um, or if it goes back to DRB, but the, the fence and the trees. So uh, that, that's it for me. Commissioner Peterson. Sure. So I, I want to start a, li a little broader than uh, pure planning commission stuff, although it, it dovetails with sort of our role um, and address the issue that uh, the appellant uh, raised at the beginning, which is the objection to uh, the format of this meeting and a, and a request to hold it off due to, to concerns about uh, accessibility and equity for, for people in the neighborhood and I think the community more, more broadly. I think um, it's, it's certainly a valid concern. I think that, you know, I, I'm not sure that a, a in-person meeting on Thursday at 4 PM is, is any more equitable or accessible to the public. Um, I think it's a, a real balancing act of trying to get, you know, the public's voice heard and make sure that their concerns are addressed in a, in a format that can be, uh, confusing difficult to access and and so on uh, but from from where I sit uh, the phone accessibility the zoom accessibility may actually be a a better format than in the in person since it allows people who may be at work or can't commute or can't get child care to still participate in the meetings so um, just to address that at the beginning I, I think it's a, a very valid concern I think it's something to, to consider if you know the city wants to change the meetings to you know 10 a.m. on on Saturday, I'm all for it. Um, but in the meantime, I think uh, the city and uh, you know the people running this have have done their best to to make it as accessible as possible. And I, I don't see the the grounds for not hearing it at all and and not conducting any city business until the COVID-19 pandemic is is over. I, I don't think that's I think that's more inequitable to. Um, 
you know, the, the residents of Santa Rosa. So uh, that broad concern aside, um, I, the, the thing that is a little uh, frustrating from where I sit is the affordable housing piece. We did get kind of rushed through this the first round um, because there was, uh, you know, a claim that they were going to do an application that that apparently never materialized. Again, I mean, at the time, the the issue was it sounded like the applicant uh, maybe had not planned it well and was asking us to play cleanup. Um, it sounds like, you know, that may have been not the most uh, truthful statement. I, I'm not implying bad con intent, but I think that if the applicant had done their their homework the first time around, we wouldn't have had to deal with uh, this appeal that is now stretched out into June. Um, so to hear it again, that there's still nothing solid and that we're just back at the, the minimum set by Santa Rosa ordinance uh, doesn't you know, strike me as particularly a, a great outcome, um, especially if it's gonna result in, in lieu fees. So um, I have to take, you know, the applicant and representative from Burbank Housing at their word that they're working on it, and I hope that it does come through. But um, it is a it is a disappointment for me to have dealt with this issue now twice in in what seems like um, an easily avoidable kind of situation. Um, the other issues that were raised by by the appellant, um, the the height issue, I, I think was well addressed by uh, Chair Cisco and, and the applicant. Um, I, I think I, I understand uh, the frustration around that. Um, even had things gone a little smoother the first time around, um, I, I don't think that that would have been enough at, at the time for me to, to uh, say no to this project. Um, Burbank Avenue is a, a scenic roadway. It's got to preserve certain characteristics. This 35 or 34 and a half, 34 and three quarters foot building uh, doesn't violate anything about the scenic roadways. It appears to be in, in compliance with all the other uh, districts and zoning requirements that are, that are there. Um, so, I, I think that this is one of those projects that isn't isn't an easy call. Um, I, I think that the nature of where Santa Rosa is at, still in a housing crisis, now in a pandemic, um, had faced fires in 2017 and 2019. Um, I think it's it's as a general matter, uh, you know, housing is a very important component of this city and it doesn't have enough of it and it's it's not getting any better at least as quickly as as we could have hoped i think this project um based on both the presentation back in in february and uh the kind of key issues that were highlighted today by the applicant has has made some thoughtful um layouts uh it's got some uh you know, it preserves the, the landscape to the extent possible while maintaining the density. It is not at the highest level of density that it, it could be, um, you know, it's it's at nine units per acre instead of 13. So I think that, that the change is um, always going to be a challenge, um, especially when, uh, you know, the, the character of the neighborhood feels like it, it is maybe under attack a little bit from this, but I, th I think that as far as that goes, this is a, a thoughtful project that is not, you know, really maxing out, pushing the boundaries, and, and it, it doesn't look like a really inappropriate project to me. Um, so I, I think, well, again, I, I don't love the process. I think that the the grounds for the appeal that we're, we're presented with, um, the questions I had, were answered and um, I can make the findings necessary to deny 
the appeal, but I'd be interested to hear from my fellow commissioners um, on any conditions that they're considering um, and uh, before sort of committing myself to a final vote. Commissioner Krupke. Yeah. Um, uh, as Commissioner Peterson said, this is not this is not cut and dry, easy, you know, go over it and make a decision, kind of move forward thing. Um, I agree that it's become a little more complicated than we all originally thought it was going to be when we first heard it. Um, I, I hear the concerns uh, from the appellant about um, not just accessibility, uh, but but um, you know the Brown Act and all of this, but those those matters are are not within our purview to take into consideration. Um, uh, so, um, in looking at strictly this project, um, you know there were a lot of questions. There was a long discussion, um, and and uh, I think I think for me at least, a lot of those questions were were answered and addressed. Um, I am interested. To, um, in, in the rest of the commission's um, opinions of Vice Chair Week's uh, um, conditions uh, regarding um, the trees and the fence. Um, but as of right now, um, I think I can make the required findings to, uh, to approve denying the appeal uh, and go forward with the project. But uh, uh, like Commissioner Peters said, I'm, I'd like to hear the rest of my commissioners' uh, opinions on the matter. Mr. Duggan. I want to I want to echo what um, my fellow commissioners have said about how difficult this process has been. It was difficult in February, and it's difficult to revisit the same uh, project and reconsider it. Um, I can make all the necessary findings for the small lot subdivision um, uh, minor use permit. Um, I would be interested in also um, adding the, um, the conditions that um, Vice Chair Weeks has um, proposed as far the design review board considerations. Uh, I think they're appropriate and um, will make it even more attractive. Um, I still have the same headaches and um, problems with the site plan that I did in February, but I understand all the um, applicants um, considerations that they have gone through a lot of iterations trying to rework and um, make the site plan work for all and it, it's just um, got they settled that this is the best use of the layout and the best use of what they're trying to achieve here uh, so I can vote in favor of denying the appeal. Commissioner Carter. Well, first, uh, thanks to the other commissioners for articulating the um, difficulties of this decision. Um, and especially to Commissioner Peterson for reminding us the importance of housing in uh, Santa Rosa and uh, how Santa Rosa continues to do uh, a great share of housing development here in Sonoma County. And, and uh, that remains a a priority for the, the boards and commissions of the city. That said, um, I think an opportunity was missed here for um, a better community planning process, if you will, that um, more actively addressed the neighbor's concerns and worked harder on implementing regional infrastructure that would better support the project. I certainly hope that possibly through other dividends to the city, there are more funds become available for infrastructure and we see the type of infrastructure that's needed to support these projects in Roseland. All of that said, uh, I, I find it very difficult to deny what is basically a, a reasonable project with a, a strong possibility of affordable component without an assurance of an affordable component beyond what's required by the inclusionary housing uh, ordinance. So um, that said, you know, with difficulty, I could 
make the findings necessary uh, to approve the conditional use permit and deny the appeal. Um, I think those design considerations as they were presented to us, uh, and my understanding is would best be applied through a design review permit might be better applied through that process than through our conditioning, uh, if I'm understanding what the staff told me uh, previously. And uh, that's all I have to say on it. Mr. Collier. Yeah, um, I agree with my fellow commissioners and especially what you just said, Commissioner Carter. Um, my understanding was the same as yours in regards to the design review board, uh, their recommendations that I was my understanding that they would be the body to condition the project to do the, you know, increase the fence and, and keep the, the, the native trees and, and those other things. Um, I mean, I agree with every all the my fellow commissioners in regards to this is a difficult project. It's not a cookie cutter project by any means. Um, we, I do really appreciate one thing. I do really appreciate about the project is that there's a continuum of housing all on the same lot or on the same property, essentially, where you have single family homes, you have the duets, and then you also have the multi-family component of it. And knowing the complexity behind uh, multi-family tax credit financing, um, I can understand the difficulties that um, the applicant is kind of wading through in regards to uh, the affordable housing component of it. And there's a lot of restrictions on uh, in order to finance an affordable housing project where that parcel needs to be located and um, essentially the separation of that parcel from existing uh, parcels. And um, you know, none of these processes regarding to tax credit financing are speedy in the best of times. And especially right now, things are moving at a snail's pace compared to, you know, very slow in the beginning. Um, so I will be supporting or approving the denial of the appeal. Although this is a difficult project, I think, uh, you know, we all agree that we all know how the dire need for housing in Santa Rosa and this project will get us, you know, a little bit closer to that. Okay. Um, well, clearly it's obvious I have problems with the site plan. Um, what I do like about this project is I really like the, the respect that was paid to the, uh, the scenic road setback and I definitely appreciate that um that's that's very important in that area uh and and I really like the fact that there's a mix of housing what I don't like about the site plan and the project is the housing isn't mixed and I really wish it had been and um I think an opportunity was missed uh you know and I I, I get what the applicant is saying with you know the difficulties of, of affordable housing, et cetera. But if it isn't affordable housing, that's market rate housing, you know, I just think an opportunity was missed to build a real neighborhood, a real neighborhood and not, it's three separate projects basically. Um, that being said, uh, I agree with Commissioner Peterson in, in, in a different time, under different circumstances, I might wanna work this one a little harder, but we, this came in under, uh, a priority development area with resilient uh, policies that would expedite uh, the, the project going forward, all because we desperately need housing and we desperately need affordable housing. So uh, with the objections that I have, I don't have, I'm not willing to deny, a, to, to uphold the, the appeal and, uh, and have the project be continued to, to be redesigned. Um, I would like the, the uh, applicant to keep considering how to make the, the, that height a bit more compatible with the multi-family, uh, uh, with the adjacent property owners. Um, as far as the, the grounds for the appeal, um, again, I appreciate uh, Commissioner Peterson's uh, 
uh, articulating um, with kind of what the dilemma is and uh, with these virtual meetings, they, this is what we've got and this is what's allowed. I do want to speak to the fact that there is no corruption happening in Santa Rosa. Uh, Ms. Crocker's job is to make sure that we understand all of the legal policies that we don't make, uh, uh, that she protects us, she protects the developer, she protects the, pu the public in terms of the policies that we're working with. And, you know, we're not in any kind of inside talks. We are looking at policies and we are applying them as, as judiciously as we can. And I think you can see in tonight's meeting, you know, we're working hard to make sure that those findings can be made and those policies are actually being upheld. So I really wanted to speak to that. Um, so I also will be uh, voting to deny the appeal. And I wanna hear from staff um, as to the question about those conditions that the uh, design review board offered up as considerations how those are captured, is that something we need to put in our resolution? Anyway, I need to hear from staff on that. Sure, Cisco, thank you. This is Bill Rose. Um, I'll take that one. So um, commissioners Carter and Collier, your incl inclinations are correct. Uh, those are conditions that stand. They're part of the record, they're part of the resolution. So the design Re review board implemented those. Uh, they did though, so with a discussion with the applicant, they're understood by the applicant team, they're understood by staff. Uh, and they will be uh, um, considered when the project goes forward through final design review and then on to building permit. So the commission doesn't necessarily need to add those conditions because the project is bound by those. What the commission may consider, however, um, is to add a recommendation uh, to show its support for those conditions. Uh, you know, this is one of those instances where two different review bodies and uh, conditions of approval are kind of intersecting to some degree. Uh, and just as a reminder, we all know this one's going to be going to the council uh, next week for the tentative map appeal. And so any additional feedback or recommendations that the commission may give uh, would also, I think, inform that decision as well. So I hope that answers the question. And if we were going to include that um, within our resolution, is there a place where that would best go? I will uh, ask um, Assistant City Attorney Crocker to maybe direct us there. I was thinking that it more, you know, you think re what if it could get communicated to council as a recommendation um, rather than as a condition actually in the resolution when we forward um, the the commission's decision onto the council and even perhaps when you give your summary to the council at the hearing scheduled for Tuesday you could indicate that this was uh, discussed robustly by the commission and that they wanted to pass along these recommendations for the council's consideration. Commissioner are you content with that method? Okay and then just again for my own um, Beat the horse together here, uh, because the because the DRB one of their uh, considerations was to, to consider the two story elements again and again. Mr. Warden was was very explicit in considering how extending the building wouldn't work. Will he be asked to explain in equal detail any other reasons why they can't be lowered? You know, some of the questions that I was asking. In other words, how how will staff or the DRB um, hear from him that those considerations were really taken seriously and can outline why they why that could not happen? Yeah, when um, a review body takes action and includes conditions of approval, and then as it moves forward to the next phase of the process and staff is um, responsible to make sure and ensure that those conditions are satisfied. We will ask the applicant to go through item by item and with an enumerated list respond in detail to how they've addressed and responded to those various conditions. So that's what we will be asking. Okay, great. So commissioners, any other questions of staff or anything you'd else you'd like to say? Okay. 
So we have the resolution uh, moved by Vice Chair Weeks, seconded by Commissioner Kalia, and the recording secretary will take our votes. All right, again, we're gonna go by alphabetical order, then the vice chair followed by the chair. So first, Commissioner Carter. So a no vote would be to deny the appeal, correct? No, no? A yes vote. <laughs> it's weird, it's weird. <laughs> a right. yes vote would approve the denial. A yes vote would approve the denial, then I vote yes. All right, and Commissioner Duggan? I vote yes. Commissioner Kalia? Yes. Commissioner Okrepke? Yes. Commissioner Peterson? I'm voting yes to approve the denial. Vice Chair Weeks? Yes. And Chair Cisco. And I also vote yes to deny the appeal. So that passes with uh, seven eyes. And I believe that concludes this item and concludes our meeting for this evening. And we will adjourn to maybe our June 25th meeting, uh, maybe July, I'm not quite sure what the status of that June 25th meeting, but to our next regularly scheduled meeting. And Good seeing you all again. <laughs> so, okay. So we can leave now, right? That's correct. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. Okay, good.